Uh, I'm Bill Lacey. I'm the director of the Institute. I want to thank everybody for coming out uh, to be um, observers of what I think is going to be a fascinating discussion this afternoon. I uh, want to start with just a, a few announcements. First of all, uh, on your program, you will see that the, uh, today is a candidate's focus post-election research. Next week, next Wednesday, Thursday, is our national post-election conference, and you can see our guests who will be here for that next week. Uh, we're very pleased with both groups. We have an extraordinary group of individuals today. Let me just uh, start with a warning that at the Dole Institute, we practice civility and courtesy to all, so you may not like, I seriously doubt very many of you won every race uh, in this election, but if one of your candidates lost to one of the individuals here on our panel, please treat them with courtesy and respect, and we had a, a bit of an issue with that four years ago, so that's why I'm making that announcement. <laughs> Audience Q&A, we are going to try to make time for audience Q&A. We will basically divide today's conference into two segments, and we're going to try to do Q&A from the audience after each segment. We will do that differently than we do our normal programs at the Dole Institute. We'll ask you to queue up at the standing microphone uh, over here on the right. I will let everybody know when you can start doing that, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. As you know, if you've been here before, we ask that you ask one question, one question only, and no filibustering. And <laughs> for those of you who know me, you know I take the no filibustering part very, very seriously. Uh, I wanted to also make a couple of observations. I was personally in touch with Mr. Greg Orman, uh, Greg uh, said most of his campaign uh, staff had been from out of state and were gone from Kansas and he felt totally comfortable not being represented, so he is not formally represented today. And Secretary of State Chris Kobach's campaign manager, Representative J.R. Clays, had a commitment in the legislature this afternoon and apparently no one else for the campaign was authorized to speak on behalf of the campaign. We were in touch with the Secretary of State's office on a couple of occasions to ask them if they would like to participate. Uh, we did not receive any response. So if you're wondering why those two campaigns are not representative, we tried, we went out of our way, and um, they chose essentially not to be, uh, not to respond. We're gonna look at, uh, uh, the Kansas elections in uh, two main segments, as I mentioned before. The first segment will focus on the gubernatorial election. The second segment will focus on the two highly competitive House races uh, and also kind of on the future, the legislature, uh, the governor-elect, those sorts of things will be in the second segment. Uh, so we're ready to, uh, to get started. This first segment will focus primarily on the gubernatorial campaign. I've asked each, we have five campaign managers from the gubernatorial and the U.S. House races here, and I've asked each of them to think about what they would like to say in about five to seven minutes, describing their pathway to victory and what, uh, went, uh, what went right and what went wrong. And we're gonna start with the winner of the gubernatorial campaign, uh, Jordy. Jordy? Hello. Um, I hope that you all can hear me, and this is kind of my first time doing something like this. I usually, as a campaign manager, I like to stay super far behind the scenes, like <laughs> freakishly far away from anything like this. Uh, so hopefully I answer your questions and, and you know, talk coherently about our campaign. Um, I think that what we tried to do as a campaign is run a race that was really authentic to our candidate, to Laura. Uh, and, and authentic to the state of Kansas and, for and to what she was hearing around the state, but in general, what she felt like the state needed. And I believe that we did that, and the way that we did that truly was from a pretty intense message discipline space. We really talked about what we wanted to talk about, and it, was, it really was nice that that also matched up with what Kansans were talking to us about. Um, and from the beginning, our message stayed pretty much the same, and I, I think we're all very proud of that. We had a small team 
a very hardworking team, a team that had a majority, or our, whole, our entire senior staff actually was women, which was an exciting thing, and I think kind of talks about the kind of state that Laura, uh, <laughs> that Senator Kelly wants to uh, build here in Kansas, and making sure that there's diversity and inclusion in state government and in the state as well. Uh, we definitely, um, you know, we had a primary that I think was competitive for all the right reasons, but I think that we handled really well. Uh, Senator Kelly is an extremely hard worker, and because of that, we raised the money we needed to do, raise. We went on TV in the way that we needed to. We talked to voters directly in ways that I think were important and kind of hit home with them for, for the most part. Uh, and we truly had a message that I think really resonated with the people of Kansas, and that's what we tried to stick with the entire time. And there's, you know, in, I think there's some benefit to the fact that running for governor is like running for president of a state, that we got to really like drive a message that we wanted to drive, and there wasn't a lot of, there's, in the federal races, I think there's a lot more distraction of what's going on at the, you know, with the president or in Washington. And here, I believe that we really got to set the tone for what we wanted this campaign to be about. Um, and when it diverged from that, we tried always to kind of pivot back to what our message is because we felt like our message was really resonating uh, with the voters. Um, I'm trying to think about what else I could say. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it just, I, and honestly, this campaign cycle was really interesting and I think we had a really good time doing it. I know that sounds maybe silly, but I think that uh, the campaign itself, you know, we start at the top and Senator Kelly feels very strongly and passionately about that she was the best fit to fix the state and kind of take the state away from the brown bat tax experiment and kind of return it to what she believes is possible here. Uh, and we took our cue from her and really were able to like run a strong campaign with a small staff, a diverse staff, and a staff that kind of, I think, can reflect what she wants this state to be. Um, and then we had a lot of great help along the way from people, you know, from both parties uh, that really wanted to, believed in the vision that Laura was trying to, to show to voters. Um, I don't know. Okay. Is that okay? Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Jordy. So that you know how great that is, I've already fouled up. I forgot to introduce everybody. So I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> <Not great. laughs> My fault completely. Caroline Sweeney from KCTV5. Uh, Carrie Gooch, who is the campaign manager for uh, Mr. Paul Davis. C.J. Grover, campaign manager for Congressman Kevin Yoder. Uh, next is Hunter Woodall from the KC Star. You just met Jordy Ziegler, who ran uh, Senator Kelly, Governor-elect Kelly's campaign. Jared Soon, who is from the Singularis Group. Pat Leopold, who ran Steve Watkins, six Congressman-elect Steve Watkins' successful campaign. John Hanna from Associated Press. Dan McNamara, who was kind enough to come all the way back from Philadelphia today, was the campaign manager for Sharice, Congresswoman-elect Sharice Davids. And then our good friend, uh, KU faculty member, yes, good friend Patrick, <laughs> Patrick Miller from KU. So please welcome these guests. Jordy, before I go to the next question, I am going to follow up with you just a moment. Would you just spend just a couple, just a few seconds, a few, a minute or so, outlining the basic message? You talked about the message uh, that uh, the governor-elect carried and the campaign carried. What was that message? Sure. I think it was pretty much threefold. Uh, it was and this is why I have communications people, because they're much better at this than me. But it was uh, fully funding our education system, uh, balancing the budget without any new taxes, and then just restoring Kansas to what it once was and ending the brown bat tax experiment. Okay, thank you very much. I want to move now to Jared Soon with Singularis. Jared was a consultant to the Kobach campaign uh, through the primary, and he is not representing the Secretary of State. But he can speak to kind of what he thought the Kobach uh, uh, primary campaign uh, entailed. But also, to start with, Jared, kind of what you saw as you were thinking about the general election, what you saw as the Secretary of State's pathway to victory. Um, so just to start out with, I think when you're, when I was working on the campaign, which was until about uh, May of, of 2018, 
I very much uh, was viewing the race from the prism of you had a candidate in Secretary Kobach that ha came to the table with a uh, several attributes that you don't normally see um, in a candidate like this. He had a very committed and devoted base. Um, he had uh, national stature um, and natural, national recognition on a, on a number of issues. He had the ear of the president. There was, there was a number of things that um, he brought to the table to begin with, but he was also very defined as an ideologue, um, as, as a talking head, and I felt like it was very, very important as the campaign launched and kicked off to really define him as a leader apart from uh, necessarily an issue set. Um, uh, the governor of a state uh, carries with it a, a lot of things outside of just a, your typical issues. Um, you're talking about somebody that people turn to when there's a crisis or any type of um, natural disaster, and it w I felt like it was very important to position him as, as somebody that could, could lead. Um, that was why we pivoted back so much to a lot of the things that he uh, was on the front lines on during the 9-11, the um, uh, pivoting to the fact that, you know, as Secretary of State, uh, a large number of the uh, proposals that he had pushed uh, were actually supported on a on a bipartisan um, viewpoint. Uh, second thing was expanding his issue portfolio. He was obviously very well known on two or three signature issues. Um, I felt like it was very important to expand that uh, to give him a broader footprint of issues uh, that he was really concerned about. Um, the third thing that I felt like was important as, as you have looked at the the pendulum swing, so to speak, in Kansas politics in terms of the governor's office changing hands from party to party um, over the years. I felt like he needed to position himself as kind of the, the candidate of change, um, especially in the, the post-Brownback era, and to begin to inoculate ourselves, you know, from attacks that he would be, be labeled as Brownback 2.0. Um, because it was, it was my vantage point from a strategical standpoint that that was actually the most salient hit against him. It wasn't that he was uh, too conservative or um, that, that being labeled as Brownback 2.0 would, would be where we would, would run into problems. Um, and then finally, I just felt like we needed to run a very intensely data-driven um, and very focused campaign. When you're dealing with a candidate that's as highly polarized, and um, this this was a race that was going to be fundamentally won or lost on the margins. It wasn't going to be won and lost by uh, motivating or persuading large large pockets of people. And uh, we needed to run a very intensely data driven campaign that really drilled down on the specific people that we could persuade, um, and then those that we could motivate to turn out to vote. Okay, I'm gonna open it up now and ask anybody to respond to this, but talk a little bit about your assessment of the political environment that the gubernatorial campaign was, was going to be waged in at the beginning of this campaign. Well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think, I think both um, Jared and, and, and Jordana have kind of framed it as people pretty much saw it. It was all going to be the key figure in the race is in Washington, he's now an ambassador, was, was Brownback. Uh, very clearly in 2016, Kansas voters repudiated the Brownback experiment. There was nothing we saw on the ground that, that said their feelings had changed about that. Uh, indeed, probably a good sizable majority of them thought the tax experiment was a mistake um, and that it was actually bad for Kansas and they didn't they they didn't want to continue that they didn't want to go back to that so um, the challenge for Kobach was to differentiate his position on the budget and taxes in favor of tax cuts 
um, and a smaller budget from brown bag and um, and the uh, the Kelly campaign stayed right on message on that <coughs> point and you know there's always this argument in politics that if you're explaining you're losing and so um, toward the end of the campaign mr. Kobach was explaining how even though he was talking about tax cuts, he wasn't talking about the same going back to the brown back tax experiment. He would do it differently, shrink government, cut spending at the same time so that it, it might work. And, you know, there was always a sense with Kobach that there was a ceiling somewhere to his support statewide in a general election. Was it 42? Was it 45? Was it 47? What, you know, arguably could it be 50 percent? But the, the, there was very clearly a, a ceiling there. And then, then you have this factor with Greg Orman as the independent candidate who turned out not to be as much of a factor as people thought. But, I mean, from the beginning, everybody, I think, everywhere kind of understood that this was going to be a debate about Sam Brownback's legacy. And to, that, and to that end, I always found it interesting, you know, you looked at the state, Trump, President Trump won it decidedly in 2016, and Kobach had tied himself so much to Trump, you know, as Jared said, very much had the president's ear, and I think Trump won the state by more than 20 points or so. And you look at this, though, and that ghost of Sam Brownback really did seem to matter more than, you know, President Trump coming out and supporting both Kobach and Watkins in a, uh, in a rally in Topeka. And that, that kind of surprised me because I talked to voters and, you know, I, I covered both the third congressional and the second, and voters were very either they loved the president or they didn't like the president. And that was very clear. Um, and that didn't seem to quite water down to the governor's race. And I, I'm not sure if that was because of the, you know, people still had that memory of Sam Brown back or because, uh, you know, maybe Kobach couldn't quite escape that, as Jared said, kind of, you know, ideologue, kind of talking head identity he built for himself. Um, because Kobach was somebody who, you know, you, you kind of count that he was always, you know, every other night you might see him on Fox News, he would be talking. Um, and for our sake, he was always pretty accessible to us. Um, and again, as John said, we, we did anticipate there would be some kind of ceiling, there would be some, some kind of, okay, you know, are, are people tapped out? And what was fascinating to me and to my colleague at the Star, Steve Lockrod, a wonderful reporter, made this point on election night that it kind of is similar to Phil Klein, the former attorney general. Can you go too far to the right where in you know, Kansas, which is a Republican state, will say, okay, that's too far. We want a little bit you know, center right, not quite so far right. Any other thoughts? What about, uh, and this is mentioned briefly by Jared, what about the Secretary of State's national profile? Is that a plus for him or is that a, at the end of the day a negative for him? I think at the end of the day, he wasn't talking to voters in Kansas. Um, one thing that was interesting about this campaign, at least for us, is we got a lot of media, we, because of the fact that I think we had really dedicated ourselves to making sure we had the resources to win, uh, we were on TV for longer than, we didn't beat the RGA, but we were there just the same week as them. And then we spent a lot more time in, the, in Wichita, where we won Sedgwick County, uh, and also in the Kansas City market and Topeka market before I think that uh, Secretary to Kobach was talking to voters about the message that he eventually wanted to show, because he, had a ve he was very well known, and he had a really high name ID for being a Secretary of State. If you think across the country, it's like, who knows who their Secretary of State is? I think a lot of people don't. <laughs> But here in Kansas, everybody knows who's, who theirs is, uh, and they felt either very strongly negative or very strongly positive about him. But I think what their campaign did, in the, especially the second half of the year post Labor Day, is try to talk, to change his image and talk to him. They talked about education. They ran several ads about education. They ran ads um, about kind of the person that he was, his bio so that voters could know that about him because I don't, I think from the national narrative that he had out there, it wasn't in the end what was at the forefront of Kansas, Kansas voters' minds. I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking from a broadcast perspective. Um, and when, when we talk about having access to candidates on any level, 
um, and having their face and their voice in front of voters. That's what I was hearing a lot from the Johnson County, Wyandotte County, um, and Miami County voters that I was interacting with kind of on a day-to-day -day basis was um, a lot of them wanted to know why, um, even though we did have access to Secretary Kobach and he did come on um, KCTV5 News a lot, they didn't understand why he was going on national programs and not more on local news. And I think because my medium is so visual, broadcast is extremely visual, um, having that disparity between him always on national news, promoting national news on social media, which the secretary still does on like Facebook and Twitter, um, that can sometimes send an, an interesting message to Kansas voters that um, local media may not be as important as national media. Um, and so that was, that was just something I was hearing from, from voters a lot, especially when it comes to um, where candidates' faces and where their voices were showing up they don't necessarily understand the differences between national and local, and they want more local exposure. I think as well, just, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's indisputable to look at his profile and say that those appearances fuel, helped fuel his rise, um, but I think that it also somewhat created a plateau uh, for him because at the end of the day, um, when you're in a campaign like that, you want to drive a specific message. And every every one of those appearances as the campaign kind of wore on, I think it became less distinguishable what his message was specifically related to the governor's race. And instead it kind of went off into these other, where essentially the news of the day was. And there's an element of that that I think is good because you're participating in a debate and you're, but at the end of the day, as has already been pointed out, his name ID didn't need to be increased. Um, where where the, the focus needed to be at was in a specific, a specific issue set. But he also seemed to kind of do things more than occasionally that, you know, built that kind of, I, I think the phrase he used was consistent conservative, but he built that kind of conservative warrior image I mean, the Jeep with the uh, replica machine gun on the back of it that was in every parade and-, and Trump people, bobblehead, don't forget the Trump bobblehead. <laughs> the, yeah, the Trump, the Trump bobblehead and Ted Nugent signed the glove box. Um, you know, he had this line in, in debates during the primary, I don't back down, I double down. Um, you know, when people complained about that parade float, he talked about the snowflake meltdown. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so he kept, he was, he was kind of the Chris Kobach that everybody knew and loved, and I was struck by the idea that you were, you were talking about people having, being able to see him as somebody who can comfort you in a time of natural disaster, and, and I, I, I don't know that he ever, I mean, he's a family man, he's got five daughters, and and, and all of that, but I don't know that he ever came across as um, cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something that I found interesting about, about Secretary Kobach was, I mean, yeah, he started off the race with, just for a Secretary of State, obscene name recognition. I mean, you and I were sitting here on a, what is it, a Wednesday afternoon talking about <laughs> politics. We're really strange people. Uh, you know, we know who all these elected officials are. Most people don't. So he was, a decently well-known quantity. Some chunk of Kansans didn't know who he was. I mean, that was clear in the polling. But his negatives were really high. You know, in, the, in the public polling, anywhere between 45 to 55 percent. And I think if you look at the public polling as the campaign progressed, and as that chunk of voters who I thought would lean naturally Republican, as you know, as that decreased, his negatives didn't change. So as people even learned about him during the campaign, they, he was not really able to change how he was perceived. And one thing that, you know, as a political scientist, it's very hard to quantify, you know, especially like studying an N of one, like a president or a candidate like, like, like Kobach or Trump. But I do wonder to what extent the presence of Trump and how people have reacted to him may have made Kobach unpalatable to a degree. I mean, I think it's fair to say that they are both politicians who, uh, they're good at putting on a show. I mean, Democrats, you have your 
you have Cory Booker and Bernie, well, Bernie's not a Democrat, but you know, people like that, they're good at putting on a show, uh, and Kobach was one of those people. And, and I, I do wonder, once you finally got someone like Trump in office for whom the show is very important, if that somehow helped you know, further limit Kobach, when if Hillary Clinton had won or John Kasich or some kind of mainstream Republican, would voters have been more willing to experiment with Kobach style? I mean, I don't know that. I mean, we look at the polling in Kansas, and you see this across the country. There, there, there are a chunk of people who voted for Trump who don't actually approve of the job that he's doing. Um, you know, C Trump got, what, 60% just about in Kansas, but Kansans are split 50-50 on him in terms of job approval. I mean, yeah, Kansas is more moderate than it is Republican in polling, but people like that Republican brand so I mean, to an extent, I, I, I do think we shouldn't totally discount the role that Trump may have played because it, it might not have been a direct one. You know, maybe in places like the Johnson County suburbs it was, I mean, looking at how that's changing, but it also could have been a more indirect one. I mean, changing how people might have just perceived or you know, received the way that Kobach campaigned. Well, I what's mean, interesting from the third is Kobach's numbers were always underwater in our district. Um, and there was just no helping it, which, uh, goes to your point of plateauing. So his numbers were underwater, and we could fire up a base, a room of supporters in the primary and the general by literally saying Kansas is better than Chris Kobach and his silly little Jeep. Like it helped fire up our base, and there was no no growth or room for growth um, from Team Kobach in the general. I yeah, I was gonna. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say, uh, looking at Johnson County. I mean, Hunter, you mentioned that. Trump did win Kansas in 2016, but he did lose the third district, 47-46, and obviously we'll get into this in the second half. Um, that played a huge role in the third congressional district race. And by nationalizing himself, Kobach inexorably tied himself to the president who was a problem in the third district and in Johnson County in particular. And I think Dave Helling may have pointed this out on uh, Week in Review a couple weeks ago. I think that the entire vote margin that the secretary lost by, you can account for it in Johnson County. Mm -hmm. And if you remove Johnson County, it was a basically even race. But if you go to that, that it was something like 46,000 and 43,000 of it, I think, was in Johnson County. So I think tying himself to Trump may, may not have hurt him in the rest of the state, but it did fatal damage to him in, in the race because of the way Johnson County voters perceived the president and perceived him uh, in the same way. CJ, that night, we I asked the secretary which counties are you watching tonight? And he said he was watching Sedgwick County for himself and Johnson County for Governor-elect Kelly. And I think that's very telling of just where the campaign may have been looking at their last minute priority. So Johnson County, I think we all know is gonna continue to play a big role, but I found that answer very interesting. I mean, to, to his credit, he stayed very um, consistent. I mean, there was no there was no pivot. <laughs> no, I, I'm not even sure he can. I, I don't know. I don't. I just. I mean, they made a very strong. At, at the end, all of their TV for the last two weeks was about Trump. Yeah, yeah. So it was. It was, it was, it was there was no play. pivot. The question is, why was there no pivot? Was it a strategic error that they thought that Orman was going to do better than what he did do, which would have allowed basically to win the gubernatorial with just base Republican voters, mm -hmm. or was it <clears throat> in the end that he, you know. Maybe he wasn't, didn't want to risk his brand for possible something else, you know, some sort of appointment or something like that. If, it, if things didn't work out, uh, you know, he didn't pivot. He should have, and he didn't. And the question is, was it a strategic error or a conscious choice? But I'm curious about that. Exactly how would he have pivoted? Because he was talking about tax cuts. He was talking about smaller government. He was talking about being tough on immigration. He was talking about Second Amendment stuff. Um, how how would you if you were if you were running his campaign how would you have pivoted? Well, I would have talked to swing voters like like in the second district. He they, I mean they literally like our the universe that we were talking to in the second district that the Watkins campaign was talking to in the second district was about 30, 35,000 households. That was almost exclusively our and they were swing GOP. They're independents. There was no overlap with Kobach. Kobach was base Republican voters. When you try to do like door knocking with them, there was no overlap. It's like those people are already going to vote, 
and they probably like him, you know. Um, but that's yeah. that's how you pivot. That's put down the machine gun, you know, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but it was almost like the criticism of that was a challenge to him yeah. that he felt the need to respond to and to show, as he said, I don't back down, I double down. Um, about the brand. Particularly. About the brand, yeah. It was all, I mean, he had a very defined brand. Well, John, I mean, you can show, show that fact that he doubled down when he brought in President Trump, right? I mean, that was him going back and doubling down on that, that same type of message, right? The, there was no way to pivot. Well, I think at that point he probably like quadrupled down. I think he yeah. doubled down a long time <laughs> <Yeah>. ago. <laughs> but I'm, that you know that that was the thing. I, I I'm not sure. I, I don't know if anybody in this room could say this you know with any clarity. Is like, can you moderate Chris Kobach? And I I think John's getting to that. I'm not sure you can. I mean, Chris Kobach's never going to go for Medicaid expansion. He's never going to go for stricter gun laws. You know, he he he. I know he ba kind of batted around what to do with schools, but he's never going to be, you know, a moderate on on school funding. So I'm not quite sure it was ever there. And to the point about him kind of in his ties to the president, I mean, let's be clear, Kobach was Trump before Trump was Trump. I mean, Kobach very much had this brand. He didn't, you know, and he tied himself to Trump early, but he had this brand in Kansas, you know, almost, you know, as soon as he was elected. And getting to the whole, back to the whole point that Patrick made about kind of the, this, the circus, the spectacle essence of this, I mean, you look at, from the day he announced, you know, I believe it was June of 2017, it was right after Brownback's tax cuts had largely been rolled back. He comes out, you know, and says, this is terrible. They, I hate that they did this. He ties himself to Brownback and the tax cuts. And then, you know, as time goes on, you have Trump Jr. come out. You have the ongoing court case over proof of citizenship and, you know, and, and all that. So his name's always in the news. You have Ted Nugent come out for him. You have Donald Trump Jr. come out for him. You eventually have Trump come out for him. The, the replica machine gun. He, I mean, he got very good at, say, at getting himself in the news and saying, okay, look at me, look at me, look at what I'm doing. And I know for us as reporters, um, I think both John and I did this, I think Caroline did as well, you make a conscious effort to, not, you know, you're not gonna report on Chris every time he pulls out the, the replica, you know, machine gun Jeep, you know, that's not news every time he does that. It's news the first time, then okay, he's doing it again, that's worth, worth a note, but you don't keep reporting on it every time he brings out the Jeep. Um, it, it, it re but it really, you know, seemed to turn him away from doing, okay, here's what my policy is. Because he seemed to welcome, I think, that spectacle. Because, I mean, I w it was funny, you know, he did the machine gun bit for on a Saturday, and we got to break that story, and I was at the gym, and I got, oh, my goodness, like, this is really happening. Um, so we get that story out there, and I, you know, texted the campaign. Five minutes later, I had a statement regarding the whole snowflake bit. So it seemed like they were prepared knowing exactly what they were doing. Um, but Chris also did something really interesting. He very much challenged, I think, you know, kind of the Republican stalwarts in the party because, you know, Nancy Kassebaum came out and had endorsed, you know, on Laura Kelly's campaign and, you know, Bill Graves had done that earlier. And he very much got upset with them doing that. And he really, I think, struggled because, you know, his, their statement was really harsh on Kassebaum. I think for your average Republican voter, there's, she's very well respected. You know, do you really want the person you're voting for, her governor, disrespecting this, this, you know, this very, you know, well-established, historically famous woman who represented your state for so long? Hunter, but remember, on election night, you and I were standing there at like, like 4:30, and he said that comment, and you and I both pushed back and said, "Are you sure that's what you want to say about these two, like, respected people in the state?" And he walked well, that back just a little bit. And it, it was interesting because he had, he, we had to correct him. He was like, oh, the same people that oppose Brownback are opposing me, these Republicans who had endorsed Democrats. And that is not the case. Bill, you know, Bill Graves had not, did not endorse Paul Davis over Brownback in 14, and Cass and Bob did not endorse Davis over Brownback in, in 14. Now, um, Graves hadn't, had gotten involved in the 16 campaigns a little bit um, with the Save Kansas Coalition. But he, he, and he very, did, he very much did struggle with that. And he actually kind of, as Caroline notes, kind of put, you know, was like, okay, I shouldn't criticize Kasim on this much. So I think he realized how that rhetoric could hurt him, even, you know, there at the end. Well, one impression that I had, I mean, I think you're right. You're not going to moderate Chris Kobach on issues. But, you know, just watching the campaign ads, it did seem to me, and I mean, you all may disagree, that at the end, he maybe pivoted back more towards talking about issues, particularly education, that might have been important for swing voters. I, mean, I think when the campaign started off, you had Laura Kelly very much talking about Kansas issues, staying very focused on that. You had Greg Orman over here being all boo third part, boo political parties. <laughs> what a, and, um, you know, Kobach being Kobach in the way that we think about him, you know, the, the Jeep and poking Nancy Kassenbaum in the eye mm -hmm. and things like that. But it, it seemed like at the end, you know, maybe the last month, he was talking more, and his campaign was talking more about education 
and then getting defensive about attacks on that, but also trying to maybe soften the edges of that somewhat in a way that didn't make him seem as conservative, even though he still had very conservative policies. And maybe that, you know, maybe if that impression is correct, that ultimately did hurt him. I mean, we, the only bit of data that we had on Brown back in the campaign is you look at the Fox AP poll they did of voters at the end, and what, 78% of voters had a negative perception of the Brownback tax experiment. So, you know, maybe if that perception is correct, if Kobach is coming back and talking more about those issues, that maybe, maybe people think of Brownback, that was not a useful strategy for him. Well, and I, I was surprised because the other thing that Kobach did toward the end was he raised utility rates as an issue, sort of that last month, electric rates, which have been climbing in, in Kansas for a number of reasons. And, you know, that was an issue that worked very, very well for, uh, and this is going to go way back, for Democrat John Carlin in 1978. There was, there was even this story about how in the old days they would put your bill on a door hanger and, and he came about this size actually. And, and, and he came up with a campaign flyer that was looked like a utility door hanger and people would pick it up and go, well, why am I getting another utility bill? And it'd be this flyer saying, Carlin will lower uh, utility rates. And so hearing that, I mean, that's a great populist consumer issue. And I, I was just kind of surprised at that. I'm, I'm, Jordi, I wonder why you think, tell me why you think that didn't catch fire. I think I would say probably two things. One, it wasn't completely true, the attack on Laura. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't Kelly. see it as an attack on her, just as utility rates are No, no, for high. sure. No, so that, that would be a small part of it. But I think the way that it was presented uh, was in a way that it was not, I mean, he put that, that specific ad, I believe, only in the Topeka market or maybe only Topeka and Wichita. It was not in Kansas City, and I think it truly was only the Topeka market. And there wasn't, I mean, honest to God, there wasn't that much money behind it. And I think that that therefore, I mean, not to be like the nuts and bolts campaign person, but that's what I am, but that not many voters saw it. And the Topeka market was so crowded because of the Kansas too. And I think, so maybe it could have resonated, I don't know, but it felt a little too late to me because I think what he was trying to do, or what they were trying to do smartly so, was to talk about issues in a way in a space that maybe wasn't as strong for, for our campaign, but it wasn't getting to enough voters. Is yeah, and the one thing that the Kelly campaign did really well is they didn't change their message at all, right? It was all pretty much, we're listening to Kansans, education, education, education. And they were talking to those moderate voters, and they think what we're talking about is what was the Kobach campaign's message besides I'm Chris Kobach and I'm gonna double down, right? And I have this huge image and this is what it was. and. I think they, they tried are. a few things at the end too, mainly because if I if they had the same polling that we did is that we were tied, and we took what happened to uh, what I think the decision for us was is that we felt very strong and confident in the message and that the, that the people that we weren't getting yet would break our way because we had proof that they would if the message continued, and for them they were worried. I think I would guess that they were worried that the message they had wasn't working. So what do you try to do to get the rest of the people? that in Kansas technically probably should vote for you. Uh, so I think they tried a few things. I mean, they, they really did, I think, in some markets, double down on the Trump message. They just ran that 15 second, which I'm sure a lot of you saw, of the Trump endorsement over and over and over again, bookended. Like, you see the 15 second, you see the commercial, and then you see the same 15 second ad. Uh, they did the utility rates, and then um, I think they went back a little bit, if I recall, to just kind of his personal story. And then in debates, I mean, which I don't think this was a, protect, a, particularly, uh, a particularly useful strategy, they started to call Senator Kelly Brownback, will the real Brownback, uh, Chris Kobach did this a few times, like will the real Sam Brownback please stand up? Making the point that, that actually the more similar to Sam Brownback was Senator Kelly, not Chris Kobach, uh, which I just think like obviously could not land. Well, um, <clears throat> and Jordy, I, I thought too, what I think it was the Kelly campaign, but I don't know. It was a little bit of a haze for me in, in the, the last few months. <laughs> but I know that I, the, of the TV that I did watch, um, I think you guys had a 15 second spot that was just basically brown back talking and then it would cut overlay with, with Kobach. That wasn't us. And then that, I thought that ad was, was particularly effective, but you know, Patrick talked about. I know in the third, Brownback's approval rating is, you know, I think in the teens. So talking about those Johnson County voters, then ended up 
being the, the death knell for the Kobach campaign, it was, I, I saw it frequently, um, just that imagery, simple imagery, 15 seconds short ad of just brown back Kobach, brown back Kobach. And it, you know, when that, ads are the most effective when they're the most believable, I think. Totally. And, right. Like to your point, is raising his hand. Like what was it, the Kansas Values Institute ad? Like yeah. raise your hand if you think. Right, the Sam last Brown debate back. that was. Uh, yeah, and then like you can kind of see like he's thinking, should I raise my hand or not? <laughs> but like he you know, sheepishly does it, and then Laura Kelly gets this look like I got you, Nick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a great ad. <laughs> you know, and, and and that might have actually been the moment. There's you know every campaign has a moment. There was a, a Joan Finney and Mike Hayden. There was a debate where he threw a question at her up what kind of helicopters do the, does the National Guard fly? And she looked at him and said, oh, no, you're not going to do that. Stop that. And we all knew then that the race was over. So, so that might have been the moment when we were all like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I think as well, just going back to what Pat was saying earlier about the, the need for him to, to pivot post-primary, I, I think in, in their minds, the the education play was him pivoting, mm -hmm. but I, I think I, w I would question to a degree if you're an education voter out there. Um, first of all, I don't think you were probably undecided on the governor's race. And so I don't think you are, I, I question what, how much that actually was able to potentially move undecided voters and whether or not there was a, there were other wedge issues out there that might have appealed to to swing voters, whether it be you know jobs and economy, which really never became a subject in the debate in the race that much. Uh, the, they did try making the utility issue a little bit of a play there. Um, you know, he talked about term limits, culture of corruption type, cleaning up government, uh, which I think could have had some could have had greater legs with a, with a wider swath of swing voters. Well, it goes back to that believability factor. Right. Voters don't believe that, really Republicans in general at this point in Kansas have trust or trustworthy on the education issue. I know this is a Kansas focused segment, but you look at the Missouri Senate race, Claire McCaskill ran a lot of ads on immigration and saying that she's the stronger border security candidate. And I just think in today's day and age, I don't, it's very, it's not very believable for a Democrat to be trusted as the border security candidate over a, a Republican, especially one in Josh Hawley, who so uh, clearly embraced the president in the border message. So it, it sort of mirrors that in a way, I think. You saw the unsuccessful candidates making arguments that just weren't believable to voters. Any other political environment issues related to the gubernatorial uh, race that haven't been brought up that anybody wants to bring up? Okay. Turnout and was crazy. Pardon? I think that was like helpful. Like turnout, I, so I did the delegates race in Virginia. Turnout was through the roof there in 2017. And in 2018, turnout was insane throughout the day. Um, and I think that was the hardest thing was to figure out, and I would imagine, at least for us it was, to figure out who was gonna show up and vote and how do I communicate most effectively to those voters. And it was this idea that like the Johnson County suburban moms were gonna show up and vote in droves and how do you best communicate to them and what is that electorate gonna look like? Um, which was, I think, the hardest for everybody around the room to figure out and who figured that out was the winner. Yeah, the eventual turnout far surpassed our yeah. modeling. I'm sure you, yeah. everybody here on this table probably saw the same thing, but we, we project, our model projected somewhere to the effect of 250 to 260,000 voters and it was, I think, surpassed 300, 300, 310,000, so that was, yeah, what we saw in Kansas was definitely what we saw nationwide. And we saw a precursor of it in you know, my home state of Virginia, 2017, where just suburbia just showed up in massively unexpected numbers, and the rest of the state didn't. Uh, you know, if you look at what we had in Kansas compared to four years ago, turnout wasn't that different in a lot of rural Kansas, marginally up or down here and there. But it surged in the large suburban counties. And that's exactly what you saw all over the country in state after state. And that did not go well for Republicans uh, at no, all, basically, anywhere. I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, looking at like one statistic is a lot of the turnout data is getting analyzed after the fact that is just amazing me is looking at a lot of the suburban congressional districts around the country. You know, we're seeing in the final data now, districts with, you know, like the third, I mean, districts that look like that, 
with turnout that is 70, 80, 90 percent of presidential turnout numbers. Uh, we're starting to find some congressional districts now where actually more voters voted in those districts like the third last, earlier this month than they actually did in 2016. Uh, so, you know, something, we, we should not underestimate the, the, the role of a suburbia in this election and how far it went, whether that's Trump driven, you know, how much of that is Trump driven, how much of that was Kobach, but, you know, that was a huge factor here and in a lot of places. Okay, I'd like to move along to the primaries and just um, I'm going to pick on Jordy and Jared to start with, but open it up for comments. Uh, Jordy, can you can you start just with giving us uh, what your assessment was of the Democratic primary race and what you guys had to win? And that one wound up being, at least from my perspective, you guys won a much more comfortable win than I think some people thought. Sure. Um, so we had a primary, and we had to win it. Uh, <laughs> I think that that, I mean, that sounds silly, but that was actually how we approached it. Uh, you don't get to the general without the primary. Um, and Democratic primaries in Kansas are not the most common thing in the, on the planet. Uh, and so I think that that was a new thing for, for a lot of the kind of talking heads, for donors, for some reporters, uh, just the fact that the Democrats don't always have a, like, a lively primary with three strong candidates. Um, and so I think really what we did to win it was just keep our head down and do what we, th what we knew we needed to do to win. We had data that showed that our message was the strongest, that Laura had a considerable, uh, Senator Kelly had a considerable base that she started out with that we could just improve upon and that we had to just go out there and honestly, that it was ours to win. Um, and I think, I think we did that very effectively. I think that um, we made sure that we had a campaign, you know, we had a campaign team and a campaign plan early on, and we didn't really stray from it. I mean, we obviously, there are, you know, primaries, I think, especially in the state, uh, and for the better, honestly, I mean, we were all over the state all the time put a lot of miles on, on, Laura's, on Senator Kelly's car. And so I think that, that that did actually resonate in a way that some people thought that it wasn't going to. I mean, I think that we had two, candidate, two other candidates who were strong contenders, Josh Soddy and Carl Brewer, and they brought a lot to the race, but we had to just go out there and win it. And we raised much, much more money than both of them. We were on TV. More. I mean, we were the only candidate on TV in a real way. Um, we spent, you know, a considerable amount of money to do that and made sure that people just continued to know about uh, Senator Kelly because once people knew about her, the message was resonating. So it wasn't, it wasn't in some ways that complicated. We just had to make sure that we did the work and did it smartly. Okay, Jared, as, as you looked, began planning the Secretary of State's uh, primary campaign, what were your thoughts about running against Governor Collier? My biggest concern, honestly, was creating, it wasn't as much focused on the primary as it was the, the segue that the primary created going into the general. And I was, I was worried about essentially cross-pressurization occurring of us losing, swing, uh, us, uh, losing swing voters in the general by getting too far to the right. In the in the primary, and that um, by by essentially the the base motivation. I mean, everybody was talking about him doubling down in the in the general. I, if I was looking at it in terms of the closing days of the primary, I would say that if he doubled down in the general, he was quadruple or beyond that down in the in in the primary in terms of just his base motivation message, which uh, is is fine for winning a primary, but it just, it, it starts to create uh, a difficulty as you move into the general. Um, so that was predominantly what I was concerned about. And then secondarily, just uh, essentially an ad coalition um, ad developing on, on Governor Collier's behalf, which ultimately came to, to fruition and that potentially causing, causing problems uh, for him on that, on that pathway. Okay. Uh, any of the rest of you have any thoughts about the two primaries? 
Well, I think it's worth noting with the Laura Kelly's campaign, you know, for a long time, she was the last, you know, Democrat candidate to announce. And for a while, you know, you had Swati, you had, I hope I'm saying that right, at least now I hope I am. At Swati, you had uh, Ward and you had Carl Brewer. And it was very clear um, to us, and I think many others, Kathleen Sebelius was very much sitting it out and just watching. She did not have a candidate that she really liked in that race so far. And I, I still kick myself over this. Um, I. <laughs> I was talking to Laura Kelly uh, a few weeks before she announced, and I actually made a joke. It's like, oh, you know, because everybody was, it seemed like everybody was announcing for governor. You had teenagers, you know, you had dogs. <laughs> and, and, I made, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I made some sort of joke. It's like, well, at least you're, you know, you're not announcing for governor or something <laughs> like that. And then two days later, she did, and I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, uh, and, you know, you mentioned the teenagers. Uh, what's that line from Scooby-Doo that maybe the governor is repeating now? I would have gotten away with it except for those meddling kids. Meddling. Meddling. <laughs> I mean, you look at the, the margin by which Kobach won that primary. I mean, obviously, the Trump endorsement the day before was very helpful to him. But you had a very crowded race, and you had, you had Jim Barnett, you had uh, the state senator, you had the insurance commissioner, Ken Selzer, leaning in on costs, as he said. <laughs> Um, and then you had these teenagers in the race, I think four of them maybe. And, um, you know, what would have happened had it been a one on one race? How would it have turned out? We'll never know, of course, but there was a suspicion that Collier, you look at the, oh, and Patrick Kachera, how could I forget him? Yeah. Um, and, um, there was this sense of maybe it would have been different a one-on-one -on -one race, maybe maybe not. I mean, um, it would have been interesting to have seen a Collier Kelly race um, in in the fall, in the sense of would it have been tougher for Kelly or easier, uh, tougher because Collier is not doesn't have the negatives that Kobach had, uh, easier because of the direct more direct tie to Brownback. So uh, the race that will never get run. Um, it, it, it did become kind of comical at one point. Um, you know, before Senator Kelly got in, you were the only gubernatorial race in the country that didn't have a woman running, but yet we had over 20 men. Yeah, we talked about Some that. who were not old enough to even vote for themselves. <laughs> uh, which, I mean, I, I love that we had teenagers running for governor. I wish my current students were that politically motivated. Uh, sorry, some of you are in the room. Uh, very happy. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, but, you know, I, and I think that was very surprising. I mean, you think about the typical Democratic primary, I mean, not everywhere, but the typical Democratic primary these days is mostly women. Uh, the parties are pulling apart on gender, whereas the typical Republican primary is mostly men these days in most states. Men who often stereotype women as liberal, which is one reason why the success rates of female Republicans is declining nationwide up and down the ballot. Uh, because of how the gender composition of their of their primaries is changing, so there was a huge space for you know a woman to get in the race, particularly on the Democratic side, that I think uh, Senator Kelly obviously exploited um, successfully. I mean, I don't say exploit in a bad way, but she 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 she, she wrote that to a win. Um, but but I think thinking beyond Kelly, it was interesting to me how when it started off, you know, we didn't have a lot of data, how a lot of the assumptions that we made, how certain candidates were over or underestimated, right? I think we overestimated Kobach, and I think we got our first bit of data on that in the fundraising data, where we expected that he would be able to leverage this immense national network and name ID into, you know, I heard from some reporters, we're gonna see a seven-figure a seven Kobach a fundraising hall in 2017, and it was like, what, $300,000? Uh, you know, I think Josh Squatty was overestimated, but I think Laura Kelly was underestimated, particularly because she is an older, quiet, policy wonk woman, you know, female, female legislator. But I also think that Governor Collier was underestimated, uh, you know, as someone who I think was often talked about as not really a vibrant, energetic candidate, maybe reluctant to get into the race from how, you know, or even run for governor from how I heard him talked about. But I think you know, at some point, the qualitative assumptions have to bow to data, and you have to realize that maybe you did over un underestimate or underestimate certain candidates. So Patrick is, has this great ability to rely on that data, and I get the chance to see a very high-level view when I'm out talking to um, our viewers in Kansas City. Um, 
even if it's not about politics, sometimes I still hear about um, politics. The interesting thing I found working in a market that straddles a state line, especially in an election year, is we are not getting one set of ads. The, like those ads in the Kansas City market, it does not matter. Like my parents live at 60th and Warnell on the Missouri side and I have friends who live on the Kansas side and they're getting the exact same ads. So talking to voters in, in, on both, in both parties on both sides of the state line, they were already kind of um, worn out and exhausted before the primaries. Um, because, especially in Kansas City, they were seeing and hearing ads from Josh Hawley and Claire McCaskill and some of these primary ads in Kansas and the second district. And then our, uh, in Missouri, there, was, there were a lot of um, you know, local, you know, we were also seeing uh, statewide um, state house races kind of starting to filter in as well. So I think when I was talking to voters, it was very interesting to hear their take on it from this high level of they don't know who to overestimate or underestimate or who even to look at at such a crowded primary in such a crowded, saturated market like Kansas City is. Um, and I think that started to show toward the end of the primary, and you, especially in Kansas, you see it in those numbers. Um, I found Jim Barnett and Ken Selzer, and I mentioned this the last time I was here too, the numbers that they pulled in are just deeply fascinating to me. And I think if Jim McLean were here, he would have already said like, hey, maybe we should put this in the context of Kansas history and look at like Kansas history, uh, voter, voting history to see how um, Jim Barnett as the you know, self-proclaimed centrist really did do a number in the primary, at least in my opinion, um, when it came to um, voters and hearing things that like a traditional Kansas voter may have wanted. Um, but that also may have been drowned out in Kansas City when it came to the saturation that people were seeing on TV. So. A, a couple of comments on the Democrat primary. Uh, one in particular, Hunter mentioned uh, a while ago that, about Sebelius's <clears throat> lack of involvement in that. And as a longtime Flynn Jenkins staffer and Laura Kelly watcher, uh, <laughs> uh, not very good. She's—I know that they're super close. Uh, so, so the idea that she had no involvement at all on behalf of Laura Kelly during the primary, I find a little hard to believe. Well, no, I wasn't—I wasn't, oh, no, I wasn't no, saying no. that. Yeah. I, I wasn't saying that. My point was sure. that before Kelly jumped in, Sibelius had been on the sidelines, okay. and as soon as she jumped in, you know, as soon as Kelly jo jumped in, I think with Sibelius' support and blessing, right. obviously. The, f the fundraising faucets of the Democratic money in Kansas really came con really came in strongly. Right. So it was just the idea that she had she had stood on the sidelines for so long because I mean, Laura didn't announce until was it December. December fifteenth. Yeah, well, I mean that, so that was fairly you know late in the in the cycle at that point. Right, and there, and that's and it's probably about personalities, but I, I I think ultimately though it's more a sign of the realignment of the Democrat Party. Uh, I mean it's happened it's happened in the Republican Party too. This idea of a of a pro life Democrat um, being viable in a primary. Uh, and today, I mean, that just, it's not, it's gone. It just doesn't happen anymore. It's certainly not. In, in, so the, pro, the pro-life Democrat in a statewide election is, is not viable. Josh Kelly is a, I mean, not Josh Kelly. Yeah, uh, Swati is a, um, is a fantastic candidate on paper. He's like the, aside from not being a female, he'd be like the perfect uh, Democrat candidate to run for a statewide office. Be, that, being pro-life uh, helps him. Um, but. In, in a primary, it's just not viable anymore. It's just not an option. Um, and the same things happen, happen on the Republican side. It's not, you know, immune to that. But I, I think more than anything, that just made, like, he wasn't even, he, he couldn't even run with those dogs. So. Okay, I want to move along to uh, the general election a little bit more now. And um, I first want to just make an observation about uh, Mr. Orman, who was the independent mm -hmm. candidate of the race. He ran a fairly strong race for Senate until it was nationalized back in 14, uh, wound up with six and a half percent. But I know, Patrick, you have written skeptically about independent candidacies, maybe not Mr. Yeah. Orman's in particular, but you want to share any of your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, oh, interesting. Um, 
you know, uh, there's a whole. Ba- I'll not even get into that. Um, so, <laughs> we, just all, look it up on all Twitter. Gotten, <laughs> all of us who've written about Orman have gotten the tweet from an Orman person saying something on the order of, "You're buying into this false narrative of Orman being the spoiler," because they really pushed back on that, and we were struck by how little the cast of the race changed, I- including with him. Uh, I mean. So, okay, a year ago, Greg Orman and one of the women, I don't know, I remember her name, but she's involved with this national independent organization. They, they wrote this op-ed, two op-eds from the Kansas City Star, that is a, is a political scientist who traffics in data and looks at data over decades about independent candidates and partisanship is just absolutely wrong, totally false for me. And it was this column that, oh, Americans are less partisan in turning to independence. No, they're not. And so I wrote a response back to that because it just was not factually correct. It was distorting a lot of data, particularly Gallup data. And so I wrote back this response about, well, here's what's actually going on. And of course, they declare jihad on me, uh, which, whatever, you know, I'm half Sicilian. I can roll with that. Uh, uh, But (laughs) the drama of that aside, but no, I, I was incredibly skeptical because you know, I think if you dig down below the surface of the percentage of Americans who claim they're independent but don't really act like it, you look at the success rates of independents, they're not getting more successful. In fact, we're going to end this election with fewer independents in state legislatures than we had even going into the election. You know, we are not moving towards a viable third party. Voters are not less partisan. They're more partisan than ever. And, you know, I, and I, nothing about Mr. Orman in particular. I'm sure he's a very nice person. I've never met him. Uh, you know, I'm glad he ran. But I think that a candidate like that, whether it is Mr. Orman or a candidate anywhere else, faces immense structural challenges that no matter how rich or successful or appealing of a person that you might be, you're not necessarily going to be able to overcome that. You know, that money can buy you infrastructure, but it bought him six and a half percent. And in that sense, Mr. Orman is like practically every other independent candidate in this country who has run for statewide office. He was a competent, normal human being with a nice bank account. And that's about where they end up. So, I mean, that was a source of my, my criticism. I think people interpreted that as some kind of personal thing. It wasn't, because I don't, don't know him. Um, but, you know, I, I think it was very clear after this election that we are not moving towards our party system fundamentally changing. And we saw that here in Kansas, and we saw it everywhere else. Okay, any other thoughts about the independent candidacy? Jared? I think it, what it reminded me of is you see this happen in in states that have runoff elections where you have a multi-way uh, primary or general and you you will see essentially the top two or three candidates start rising to the top and then very very frequently um, as you get close to the end that that third person or the fourth person just they just start the bottom falls out of uh, their numbers and so forth because people just, they view it as potentially wasting their vote. And I think that you saw that a lot with the the Orman candidacy. The other thing is, is that I, uh, I would say that um, when, when you look at Trump's disapprove or approve numbers, um, his strongly disapprove numbers, or the strongly disapprove is where virtually 100% of the, the disapproval comes from. And so people that uh, were left of center or um, against the president, they weren't looking for, they weren't looking for an independent option. They wanted, they wanted, they wanted a Democrat to vote for. And so I think in a different electoral environment, there might have been, um, slightly different uh, outcome or he would have at least done better, but I, I just don't think that there was any appetite on the part of left of center voters for anything less than, than a, full th- uh, a full Democrat. And then the other thing is, is I think that just from the message development side of the Orman campaign, they were very um, tactful in terms of selling the independent message but I don't think they ever close the loop of, you know, what does it mean for you? Um, how is this actually going to 
impact your pocketbook? How is it going to impact your life? And you know, the whole theory of independence uh, in uh, political discourse is great, but I don't, I don't feel like they really made it palatable as to uh, a motivating factor for, for a voter um, and what it would mean for their daily, and, daily lives. And then you had his big example of an independent governor who could govern across party lines, Bill Walker in Alaska. But he didn't. <laughs> he, his campaign imploded and he withdrew from the race for things, pro, uh, for some comments his lieutenant governor made. And I, yeah, it was, what, what struck me was how little traction Orman got. And I remember a comment from a Democratic National Committee member who said, what really, and this was in October, he said, what really unites Democrats right now is how, and I'll, I'll clean it up, how angry we are at Greg Orman. Um, and, you know, I was looking at some numbers last night and it was all over the, Orman's effect was all over the map. You could see a few counties and you could see counties in western Kansas where he actually held Kobox numbers down as Kelly was roughly the same. Um, there were some counties, rural counties, where they seemed to split in terms of how much they lost and, and some others. So. I just, it, it struck me that he just never really became the big, I mean, we were talking about candidates who are overestimated. He really, really was overestimated. I think you look at the execution of that, right? So, so Mr. Orman, I mean, first, look at the Fox Bowl at the end. Seven, only 17% of Kansans have a negative view of both political parties, not the highly inflated number that he was pushing. Laura Kelly won those voters over 70%. He didn't win them. She won independence. He didn't win them. If you look at how he marketed himself, he tried to project an image, and politicians do this all the time, where the image is not necessarily the substance. And I think that was a fair critique in his case, because he projected this image of, I'm this moderate centrist. But then whenever he tried to differentiate himself from Laura Kelly, he was hitting her from the left whether it was on Medicaid expansion or Kobach's voter regulations or guns, you know, I, I think particularly at the peak of that, it was fair to wonder who was the biggest liberal in the race, whether it was him or, or Kelly. And so I had to create the prototypical independent candidate, which not Bill Walker in Alaska, by the way, he only won because he got the Democrat to drop out in 2014 and be his running mate. Uh, and then he functionally governed as a Democrat. But if I were to create that independent who could come in and actually make it work, you know, it might be someone with the business profile or the, the professional background of Mr. Orman, but not with his partisan history, you know, particularly as a big Democratic donor, and certainly not with his issue positions. From a reporting perspective, it was always rather interesting because, and John can feel free to correct me on this, I cannot think of a Greg Orman in-person press conference that we had this entire cycle. I mean, John, can you remember one? No, I, I, we had some individual interviews, but right. you're right. He never had a general news. He, he had, didn't have a. He didn't have like have sent out a press release, but there were times when he would. It would be like an informal gaggle, like when they were count, when they were going through and double checking the signatures on his petition and. Right. Like a majority of us were there waiting around for him to say something. He like walked up to us, but there was nothing that was like a press release. Please plan to be here at this time. They had one place. planned press conference and it got canceled because that was the same day. Was it was that Cass Palmer Graves? It was Graves. Yeah, and that you know they canceled <laughs> the press conference immediately. Okay, I would like to move along, but uh, I want to ask Jordy again a very specific question to you and get c comments from uh, from the panel. How did you guys go about? getting all those Republican endorsements and how important do you think that was in the outcome of the election? Um, how we went about getting them is honestly, I mean, maybe not the like fun, interesting answer, but the truth of, what, of it is, is that Senator Kelly has a long standing relationship with these Republicans and they like her. Like that, you know, her and, her and Governor Graves have a long history, her and Senator Kasselbaum have a history, um, and they had worked together and they had a, they had an opinion of her that they they shared, which was that she would be a good governor for the or the, the better governor for the state. Um, and so I think that we did. I do give our team some credit because I think we rolled them out in a way that was helpful to our campaign. Um, we rolled out uh, Governor Graves, 
I think it was right after the state fair debate, and I think that Senator Kelly had a particularly strong performance there in that debate as well. So I think that kind of set the tone of the fall campaigning um, that that we were like we were here to win it, you know, and in a way that maybe after the primary and whatever else was going on, maybe that wasn't yet the tone. Um, and then I think with a lot of the legislature legislators and former senators or current senators, I mean, she just had strong relationships and they respected the way that she was going to govern. Um, and I think we rolled them out and communicated them in ways that uh, that really that not to go back to this, but that fit in with the message that we were trying to, that we were, that we were talking about, which is something I haven't talked about a lot, and it was a strong part of our message, is that Senator Kelly could work across party lines and really get things done. And I think that was what a lot of people were looking for, and she had the very legitimate creds on having done that. So um, to CJ's point, like, it was believable because she had done it, and then we had people who were furthering that opinion about her, and we had, you know, I think we had our ad with uh, Senator Boyer and Senator Tom Hawk that just kind of furthered that message, and, and it, it was believable, I mean, honestly, because it was true. And I'm curious as a follow-up to that, Jordy. I saw a lot of those commercials, Republicans endorsing uh, Governor-elect Kelly in, the, in Johnson County. Was that something you focused in the Kansas City media market, or did you run those out west as well? Uh, we focus on the Kansas City media market and in the Wichita market. Okay. Um, so yes, the answer to, we did run them at, at West. In the Topeka market, I think we did a little bit more of the, um, we did a little bit more education there, a little bit more, because actually, interestingly enough, uh, in some of the data we got back early in October, that was a place where Greg Orman was one of the, that Topeka market was the place where he was the strongest at the time. It didn't end up that way. And I think a lot of that has to do with state capital media markets and how kind of the view of when you get a lot of information about the government, what some people then view of about the government. Uh, and so we, we stuck, I, I think we, then we ended up showing it everywhere, honestly, but I think we started uh, that in, in Kansas City, but actually more specifically in Wichita. Okay. Any other thoughts on Republican endorsements of the governor-elect? So I, I followed that topic uh, quite strongly, I think, th <laughs> through, the, through the cycle because and I think that was the most crucial threat of this campaign was Republican anxiety about Chris Kobach and how the Laura Kelly campaign capitalized off that. Because, you know, when you had, I, I believe it was in August, you know, House Majority Leader Don Heineman sent an email to the centrist moderate Republicans in the House, said, do not endorse Orman, do not endorse Kelly, you know, it could hurt your career. And it, it wasn't so much a threat as it was, I am actually concerned this will hurt your career. Um, and I know John Dahl, Greg Orman's running mate, a state senator who went from being a Republican to an independent who used to be a Democrat, was very upset by that because he thought, okay, I could, he thought he would be able to get some endorsements from lawmakers. But even just that, I mean, the f very fact that the Republican House Majority Leader had to send an email to Republicans saying do not endorse a Democrat or an independent was a huge sign there's clearly a problem here. And it was, I, uh, my colleague Jonathan Shorman, I think, will laugh at me about this because uh, he helped me for about, I think, two weeks. I contacted every member of the legislature that was on the that was an incumbent and on the ballot about whether they support their party's nominee, both Democrat and Republican. I believe 92% of Democrats said yes, I support Laura Kelly. Um, I think it was somewhere around 40% of Republicans either wouldn't respond or would not support Kobach. Um, you know, there were there were issues there, and I, I might begin those numbers a little bit wrong, but I know. It was clear not all Republicans are not unified around Kobach, um, and that and that was very clear. And again, the Kelly campaign did, I think, did a, you know made that point of okay, here are you know people supporting us. And uh, to that end, Senator Barbara Boy, who I, I know you mentioned, she you know came out early and she had actually endorsed a Democrat in the primary against uh, Representative Yoder. And you know, Senator Susan Wagle immediately stripped her of she had she was I think vice chair of the Health Committee in the Senate. And you know she, she's still on the committee, but she lost all of her kind of leadership roles. Um, but Barbara, you know, really kind of doubled down. Was like, okay, I'm you know I support Laura, and this is the right thing to do. I know a lot of moderates weren't happy with her because it put them in a tough spot because you know I, they did not want to come out and endorse some endorse a Democrat because they worried they would lose their race because he got into the general. And a great example is uh, Melissa Rooker. You know, she you know a moderate Republican from Fairway. 
she, you know, she told me, you know, she was one of the lawmakers said, I'm not voting for Kobach, but she would not say, yes, I'm voting for Kelly, yes, I'm voting for Orman. And she lost her race to a Democrat, um, like, you know, I think it was a few, 100 votes or somewhere around that. If she had, you know, if she had come out and endorsed Kelly, does she win that race? I don't know. But it's clear, you know, Kobach and, you know, Republicans, you know, both Mott and even conservatives had a very, I think, tense relationship. Yeah, the, with, with Kobach. Very quickly, please, yeah. John. With Kobach, uh, uh, the phrase I would use for it was, there was a lot of mildly um, apocalyptic rhetoric from his critics about what would happen, and, and, and I'm actually serious about that. There was, the, there was rhetoric about uh, as if it were almost the end of the world um, in a way other than President Trump that I've, I've, not, I've, I've not heard from, from critics. I'm, I remember talking to one voter during the primary and asking him his thoughts on Kobach being governor, and his exact quote was, oh God, it horrifies me. And I just, you didn't get that with Collier or other candidates, and that to me was interesting. Okay, I have one last question, then we'll open it up to audience Q&A for a couple minutes, but uh, if we could go this fairly quickly. Can I guess get everybody's reaction if you have a feeling about the quality of the two gubernatorial campaigns, and Hunter, I'm going to start with you because uh, the piece you just described was one of the pieces I remember best that you wrote during the cycle, but the other one was the one, the post-mortem on the Kobach campaign that was very critical, I believe. Well, and that was interesting. So the story that Bill's referring to was, um, that, you know, we immediately, uh, at when Kobach lost, I got communications from Republicans essentially saying, um, and again, that, not that that was the prevailing, Republic, prevailing Republican attitude, but there was clearly some Republicans who, I wouldn't say they were happy that Kobach lost, but there was some sense of relief. Um, and it was very clear talking to folks, you know, strategists, you know, folks within the party, fo you know, just Republicans involved on the ground level, that Chris had run a campaign that, you know, they clearly had issues with. I mean, we, you know, we obviously vetted everything. We talked to a lot of folks. Republicans weren't happy with how he ran his campaign. They, I mean, there was a joke of, you know, you'd say the, Co I'm just quoting one person, you'd say the Kobach campaign and the, then somebody else would go, what campaign? Um, you know, uh, one source described it to me, you know, check logic and reason at the door when it, you know, when it comes to Chris. And it was clear, again, there were, there were issues with Chris within the Republican Party, and, you know, I'm not sure if that goes back to uh, issues between, you know, the Collier and Kobach camps, and with the Collier camp, they had a lot of the Brownback team, and um, I think Jared might be able to weigh on this too. Kobach did not embrace what the, the Brownback team of, you know, David Kensinger and Mark Dugan had done so successfully in 10 and 14. And whatever you say about Brownback, and my colleague Brian Lowry has pointed this out numerous times, Brownback won. He never lost an election. And, you know, he was able to fend off a pretty fierce challenge from Paul Davis in 14. So, you know, the roadmap was there for Kobach to win, I think if he followed that kind of, you know, that brown back path, and he clearly did. Okay, well, with that, anybody else want to comment briefly? I'm kind of running short on time. So with that, I'm going to open it up to audience Q&A. Remember, if you would like to ask a question, please queue up at the microphone over on the far side of the room. Anybody have a question? Looks like we're going to have a couple. I, I'm sorry, can you speak more, pull the mic down a little bit, sorry, that's awfully tall. Okay. There you go. What effect do you think uh, ranked voting would have, would have had on oh. the gubernatorial? Wow, election? that's a tough question. Yeah, okay, I'll do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, uh, so, so ranked voting is a system where, uh, <laughs> political scientist hat on here. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a system where you have all the candidates on the ballot and then you rank them in the order of your preference. and. Uh, typically, you, you say we want someone to get a majority of the vote, so you count up the voting on the first round, and if no one gets a majority, you uh, start eliminating the bottom candidates and then reallocating their votes and the second choices, or you might do some other variant of that. Um, it's not very widespread in the U.S. We have it in a couple localities that have nonpartisan elections. It's really hard to say 
it has much of an effect on really anything. It doesn't really have an effect of electing more women or minorities. Uh, Maine has adopted it now for its elections. Um, one of the things we often hear about ranked choice is that it will lead to the election of more independents and third party candidates, and that's not the case. In fact, there are gonna be fewer independents and third party candidates in the Maine legislature and the next legislature than there were in the last one. Uh, really, ranked choice just has the effect of allowing people to vote for minor candidates or third party candidates or independents like Greg Orman they can express that vote up front without spoiling the race, but then their votes just get reallocated to the third part, to the, to the two major parties. So in short, I don't think it would have had an effect. I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to play the contrarian here because my gut, my just raw gut tells me that Collier would have won the primary under that system. Oh, yeah. That, okay. I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because, uh, Barnett got what, 10 percent? Yeah, 8, 10 percent. Yeah. And those were not going to be Kobach voters. <laughs> and, and probably neither the Seltzer voters, who, who, who knows? But I mean, the, 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 the thing that's interesting to me about ranked choice, just from a journalistic standpoint, is uh, you're, you know, you're waiting days and days to find out who exactly wins. Oh, and, right. and, and, you know, Sometimes the, in Johnson County that happens anyway. Yeah, well, yeah. they're true, indeed. <laughs> or in California when they, when they get their yeah. mail ballots in. Um, yeah, that's an interesting. That's an interesting idea to adopt it. It would be interesting to see. But my my gut tells me Collier, it would have been a Collier Kelly race. Okay. Patrick, you talk about that main race too. Bruce Pollock went actually lost because of ranked choice voting. Yeah. He he took yeah. he had the plurality, uh, and then after the ranked choice votes were reallocated, he lost, and he's now subsequently filed a lawsuit alleging that ranked choice voting is unconstitutional. So. Um, may not be even be an option, frankly, after this, uh, see how that court ca case plays out. But it did have yeah. an effect on that main race. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a main second district, the Republican incumbent lost. After, so you, you say he first got a plurality in the first round, mm -hmm. but then when the minor party candidate votes were reallocated, the Democrat defeated the Republican incumbent there. Okay, Mr. Quick, brief question. You have two other people behind you there. Is this on? It is. It is on, okay. You can pull it up, though. I, I, heard, I heard Helling say that the Johnson County uh, margin was the key. I think he is partially correct. It is very significant. But I think also you have to look at Sedgwick County in that area. It's about 30 percent of the vote of the state, that county and the uh, adjacent counties. And she carried it by 9,000 votes. And that's a significant thing for a Democrat to do. Uh, I don't know if it means that Sedgwick County and Wichita are getting over the abortion, gun control, decline in unions, suppression of votes uh, situation or not. But I think that is an element that cannot be denied. It, it, we, we tend to look in this area, the Kansas City and Topeka, but we got a big bunch of votes down there in Central County. Also, this county had the largest margin for, for Kelly, 74%. And we gave her a margin of 25,000 votes. So it wasn't just Johnson County that was the key. It was, the, it was a major factor. But she did an excellent job uh, throughout the state. Any reaction to that? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I think Secretary Kobach's campaign knew that, absolutely. Again, I go back to that one question I asked him on election night. And Hunter and I were sitting next to each other watching the Secretary of State's return map. And Sedgwick went light blue very early, and I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. Um, Shawnee County didn't even come up. I mean, Shawnee County, it, it may have been on Secretary of State, uh, it may have been on the Secretary's uh, mind, but he wasn't even looking towards um, Shawnee County. So although um, Johnson County is, is changing and the way the voters are, are discussing things is changing and maybe the way they're voting is changing. The fact that Sedgwick, Sedgwick County was light blue so early that night was really telling to me. And so it, it definitely was not uh, on the back burner. The, these um, candidates knew they needed to look at Sedgwick County. Okay. Yeah, I've I mean, for us, Sedgwick County was, I mean, we, you, you're exactly right. right. We won it by 9,000 and Paul Davis lost it by 3,000. And when you look across the state at the 2014 um, 
results and returns, you, we knew that there, had, there were places we could pick up votes and Sedgwick County from the beginning for us was always very important. And I think you could look to the, the choice for a variety of reasons of Senator Lynn Rogers as the beginning of that strategy for us, for sure. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions, both of our folks who are queued up. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, messaging that went into ads and what media markets certain ads went into. Uh, as a young person, I would laugh with my friends because I know that these ad wars are going on and they're just flying over our heads. Like we do not watch cable television uh, and almost none of my, my friends do, or people in, in my age cohort. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, basically the, the only two people who reached me and my friends where we were, which was on uh, like ads on Hulu and ads on the internet were Greg Orman with his red and blue Gatorade uh, and uh, Brian McClendon, uh, running for Secretary of State. Uh, so I was wondering what, if any uh, particular effort there was from the congressional and gubernatorial campaigns to reach young people and turn them out in the wake of uh, the Parkland shooting and, and whatnot. Yeah, let's just do that for the gubernatorial race. We'll get to the congressional races in segment two. So I would say uh, <laughs> we did spend a considerable amount of money on digital advertising. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, but I think if I'm being honest about you as a, as a voter and probably your friends, is you weren't the prime target for us, at least. You were the prime target for Greg Orman. I could totally understand why. You're, I am assume, not to call you out, but probably a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> young Democrat president. Uh, uh, and also lean a certain way that we felt from our digital targeting, we had you, we had you. Uh, and, and maybe didn't have all of your friends, but that's kind of, I think, for us, at least, Probably, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but I do think that it's really important. It's something that the Republicans have really done very well na nationwide. It's put a lot more money into digital, and I think that our our campaign took that seriously. Mm -hmm. And and reaching out to the young people in this state. I mean, I think that there was sometimes this view that because of the candidate that Laura, that Senator Kelly was, that she couldn't speak to younger voters in the state. But I think she really did with the messages that we used. And and you're right. We like, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, of emphasis put on on television, but I strongly believe, and I think that we did through our campaign, is that digital is a big new frontier, and it has to be considered if we want to continue, if de anyone wants to continue to win, because I mean, young turnout, uh, young voter turnout did grow, and that's really impressive, I think, and shouldn't be kind of forgotten. But good question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would uh, echo what Jordy said. We worked very hard here towards encouraging young people to vote, and the turnout among young people was uh, was much, much higher this year. So okay. final, final question. Sure. Uh, this has to do with campaign process. And sitting at our table are five campaign managers, and Ms. Ziegler is the only woman. What's it going to take to even that score so that we see a more diverse process in developing and running campaigns? Should the woman answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> you can, I, I, you can certainly actually, go for it first. When she said that most of, almost all the senior staff on the Laura Kelly campaign um, was women, I said, will that trickle down to women in Kansas? What have we seen in Kansas over the past two years when it comes to women in campaigns? So like, I think as the other woman sitting at the table and not working in a campaign, I'm deeply curious to see what kind of impact um, a female governor-elect and a powerful uh, female campaign staff is going to have on women here in the state? Um, so, you know, I think, I don't know the answer, of course. Um, I did come from an organization, the, where I was before, I was the political director for, the, for Emily's List for the Western region, um, which is an organization that helps Democrat win, run, women run for office. And I think that the best way to continue, I mean, when I wanted to be a campaign manager, I very strongly wanted to run a statewide race this cycle. Um, and it's true, I didn't have a lot of women in my life to look, look up to who have also done this. So I guess my best, my best advice or my best way to think about it is just continue to do it. That you have to be an example for, you need to be the example that you want to see. I know that's like a, like a pretty common phrase, but I felt like, if I wanted to run a bid race, I would gotta go do it. And now, you know, our senior staff who are all women and, you know, a lot of our other staff and our coordinated director was a woman as well. Uh, and I think that that's really, it's important. And I think there's, 
there's a lot of avenues um, to make sure that are open, and I do think in a job process and in and in lots of spaces, you just need to make sure that you don't always just hire the people that you know or the people that are in your circle, but you think outside of the box of the people that don't necessarily apply for jobs or can't apply for jobs the normal way because your friend knows them or they worked on a campaign with you, is that you just continue to make that a priority in hiring and a priority in managing and running. And if you can do that, and especially if you continue to do that, uh, not only, and also, you know, I'm a white woman and there's only one person of color up here as well, uh, and I think we need to continue to make sure that in all spaces, not just Democratic or Republican, just in all spaces that we're continuing, but especially in politics, that we're continuing to engage people that, you know, we're trying to represent in all different levels. Um, I don't know how to fix that today, but I just think, I'll keep managing so people keep seeing me managing. And on the upside, uh, <laughs> Congresswoman-elect Sharice Davids has a female chief of staff, female district director, and I was the only guy um, on the campaign, um, and the only guy, well, I was the only guy in the primary on staff, um, and I was the only male um, at the senior staff table. And it, it really does change how the conversation goes when there are, majority women at the table and majority people that don't look like me. And I'll note too, uh, Congressman Yoder had a wonderful woman, a uh, friend of mine, Kate Durst, running his campaign in 2016, and she won by 13, and then he handed the reins over to me. <laughs> um, and we lost by 10, so I think you have a point. Man, where, where we... Well, and, and, and isn't, Jordy, I mean, the, the best way to probably ensure that that, that more women get hired as campaign managers is just to hire them and, and I mean, you're doing a great thing by winning. Yeah, sure. Or winning or losing a close, close race. I mean, you're, you're an example that it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I will say that I think what's, what excites me about like uh, Kansas with Senator Kelly as governor is that I think she, she also values that. It's very important to her. And it's not just about it is about who's qualified, of course, but I think, you know, Laura feels very strongly that lots of voices should be at the table in Kansas, and it, that, that means, and that means something, so I think yeah. you just kind of push that forward. Okay, on that note, we're going to conclude our first segment. We will regroup here in about 11 minutes at, uh, <laughs> you're laughing at me, but you know I've got to run the trains on time at 2.45, so thank you all. <laughs> Excellent discussion that is panel. A good question. That's shit. What a grab that was my job.
Everybody, if I can get your attention, please find your seat. We're about to get started. Okay, I'll give you about a minute to find your seat, please. Okay, we're going to shift our focus in uh, this second segment of our Kansas post-election research to our post-election conference to uh, the two most competitive House campaigns, but then kind of a, a final discussion of what all of this means for the future um, so that uh, I don't blow this like I did in the first segment. I'm going to go first for introductions, Caroline Sweeney, KCTV5. Kerry Gooch with the Paul Davis campaign, C.J. Grover with Congressman Yoder's campaign, Hunter Woodall, KC Star, Jordy Ziegler with uh, Governor-elect Laura Kelly's campaign, Jareb Soon, the Singularis Group, Pat Leopold with Congressman-elect Steve Watkins' campaign, John Hanna, AP, uh, Daniel McNamara with Congressman-elect, uh, Congresswoman-elect uh, David's campaign, and Professor Patrick Miller, KU. Please welcome them. Let's start on the, uh, the, the, the second district uh, primary today. Um, let's start with uh, Pat Leopold. Pat, would you take a few minutes to outline the Watkins path to victory and the challenges presented uh, by uh, the GOP pushback to your candidate? In the primary? Uh, in the general, mainly. Okay. How you resolve that. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, well, well, first of all, I was not I was not involved in the primary. I became the campaign manager um, after he won the primary, um, so I was just dealing with the uh, general election. But without a doubt, uh, that was basically job one when I when I arrived was um, uh, I mean reaching out to the party establishment. I mean the reality was during the uh, during the primary he was one of seven or eight people running. The, he was the only true outsider. There were. Uh, state senators, uh, state rep, there was, everyone was much more well known by the party establishment uh, than him. So, th so when you're talking about the county party leaders, the you know, county uh, you know, chair, vice chair, those kind of officers, they all knew all the other people and they kind of picked amongst those, um, amongst those the people that they knew. So, um, but Steve was able to win on an outsider message. Um, it's a this 2018, the outsider message had great appeal. He was the only one that could carry that banner, um, and he ran with it, and he, and he, and he was able to win uh, a tight primary election thanks to that. Um, but then, yeah, we needed to, so the first job was to reach back out to those, you know, the party leaders, and they just really needed to get to know him. Because the, uh, they sent out, uh, there were like 50 of them signed a letter that uh, uh, Davis used very effectively during the general election. Um, talking about how they don't support him, uh, how they did, did not support Steve Watkins. That really wasn't exactly what the letter said, but uh, they had a lot of questions about him. And it's largely, again, just because they didn't know him, they, some of it was some misinformation that had been flying out there. So we just set up round tables. This isn't rocket science. It's not overly complicated stuff. It's just set up round tables, private invites. We're inviting all these uh, GOP elected officials throughout the district, Southeast Kansas, Northeast Kansas, you know, um, through, we, uh, in Topeka, we did one in Topeka, you know, we did them throughout. And it's basically, he gave his little spiel, he talked about who he was, he talked about his bio, um, he talked about his values, his beliefs, and then just opened the floor and they asked questions, and asked questions they did. And they had a lot of them, and they were tough, um, shockingly tough at times. Um, but he answered them, and I think he, he grew a lot of, he got a lot of respect from people from that. So within a week, two weeks after the primary, um, virtually all those people who had signed that letter were already on board. So that was, it was, um, it was not a process, I should note, that I was unfamiliar with. I ran Lynn Jenkins' campaign in 2008 um, when she knocked off uh, Jim Ryan, who was trying to make a comeback. Dealt with a lot of the same issues. He was the, much more of a known quantity. Now, admittedly, Lynn Jenkins was the state treasurer, because, so she was much more well-known than Steve Watkins, who was walking into this 
with no political experience. But even so, the, at that level, those people almost <laughs> exclusively backed Jim Ryan. So we went through a very similar process. This was a process I was familiar with. Um, but we, and, and then after that, we needed to reach out to, um, uh, to appeal to what I would call uh, traditional Republicans, uh, affectionately known as the like Bob Dole or Len Jenkins Republicans, and get them on board because they were skeptical of him. And that was a little more complicated because that's like a group as opposed, like it just, it's a, it's a, it's a collection of people that you can't sit down and meet with. That's more about actually winning the election. The first part was just about winning over individual party officials and getting them on board. Okay, okay, Carrie, let's, uh, let's uh, take a few minutes to get your um, uh, interpretation of the Davis campaign path to, to victory. Sure. And how, what worked out and what didn't work out. Sure, yeah, so our, I mean, our path to victory was kind of was two-pronged. One, it was compete everywhere, right? We know in the second district there are 25 counties. You know, there are a couple of really big ones, but when you get down to it, there are 25 counties. And to win this race, we couldn't get killed everywhere, right? We couldn't just run up the numbers in the big counties. We had to also not lose some of the other smaller ones, you know, 80-20. We had to be closer to the, you know, 60-40 type of mark. So we, we seriously took that into strong consideration. We took that so seriously that one of the things I did with every member of my staff in order to get hired, you had to know all 25 counties in the district and be able to put them on a map. Like, it was serious for us to not only say that we were going to compete everywhere, but actually go out and do it. That was one of the reasons why Paul kicked off his campaign with a listening tour, going to all 25 counties, right? We wanted to show from day one that, you know, Paul was going to go and compete in some of these counties and towns that Democrats don't always or usually compete into, especially in this race. Uh, the other thing was that we knew that this was going to be a turnout race, right? We kept hearing nationally about how, how much this blue wave was happening, but we did know that that wasn't something that was just going to happen. We had to almost make that happen. So we had to do things. We had to be places. We had to go places and do things to do everything that we could do to kind of boost the turnout on for our Democratic base as much as we could. And we had to do that all with, without making any mistakes. At the end of the day, this Kansas 2nd District is a very Republican district, right? So we had a very, very small margin of error that we could um, have if we were going to win the race. Um, so yeah, what I, what I think that worked out well for us, uh, we did go everywhere. We did compete everywhere. We, we hit our goals in a lot of these smaller counties that we didn't even think that we were going to get close to. Um, and we did have a great turnout, but you know, at the end of the day, I think that we came really close, uh, but just weren't able to get all the way over the edge. Okay, very good. We're gonna lump the, the two campaigns together just a little bit because they have the same kind of environmental issues and everything. Uh, so Dan McNamara, I'm gonna ask you to describe uh, when you came into the campaign, what you felt that uh, Congresswoman-elect David's uh, path to victory was. Yeah, so I started in the campaign. So I think the problem with the David's campaign was time. Uh, Sharice announced her candidacy on Valentine's Day 2018, which is very late to announce a candidacy, but there was a change in the primary field. Um, so resources and time were always um, the thing we were fighting on the campaign over and over again. In the primary, my path to victory was actually to win Wyandotte County and let everybody else fight over the rest. And that didn't happen. Um, in fact, in the primary, we killed it in Johnson County and did not do as well as I thought we would um, in Wyco. And again, like I talked earlier in the last session, part of our decision to rely heavily on TV in the primary was we didn't know what the electorate was gonna look like and what turnout was gonna look like in that particular election. Um, so we needed to raise every dollar we could and go up on TV because the one thing we did know was Sharice's late entrance into the race didn't hurt her. None of our primary opponents had higher name recognition than her, and we knew that people liked her story. The idea of being raised by a single mom, going to Johnson County Community College to the Ivy League, and then working for President Obama and wanting to come back here to Kansas to make sure everybody had the same uh, access to opportunity and education and healthcare that she had. Um, so once we figured out that we won the primary at 7.30 a.m. while Sharice was on the way to the hospital because one of our staff members had a baby. Uh, we called her and she found out on the, in the car with her mom. We had to quickly uh, move to the general. Um, and so what we found was the message that I just said, uh, her going to JUCO to an Ivy League school and then working for President Obama was a great message for the general as well. So there was only really a week um, that we weren't on TV from July going forward to the campaign. Um, I remember writing budgets in the general and being like, oh my God, how are we gonna raise this money? It was so hard to raise $500,000. Um, and very fast money came in. 
uh, in a way where I think we caught, I, CJ probably can speak to this, I think we caught you all off guard. We, I was caught off guard by how much money we were raising. Um, and the one thing we knew is that Mr. Yoder couldn't define us. We were an unknown quantity to the electorate. She had never ran for office before. And we needed to make sure that everyone knew that Sharice Davids was raised by a single mother, went to Johnson County Community College, went to an Ivy League law school, <laughs> and then worked for President Obama, and that she wanted everyone to have the same access to education. Uh, which we did over and over and over again. The other thing that was interesting about working for Sharice is she's such an interesting person. Um, everyone that talks to her and meets to her loves her. She has like, she's an MMA fighter, LGBT community, Native American, and it was literally part of our job was to figure out which parts of her story do people relate to most. And you guys saw what we did. Okay. Well, I've got to say, it's obvious we're the message discipline. That's what you call that when you talk about coming back and forth. <laughs> comes from, and that's very, very impressive. Let me, let me, Dan, if I may ask you a follow-up uh -huh. question related to uh, kind of a ret from a retrospective point from now looking backwards. Mm -hmm. How big of a plus was it for you to be uh, challenged in a primary by an individual who received Senator Sanders' endorsement, the more progressive endorsement? How valuable to As you? As a person who's personally very progressive, I was pissed. <laughs> um, but um, it was helpful. The, the whole primary experience, so it was helpful under the fact that we raised a lot of money and he raised a lot of money. It raised the profile of the race um, and it made us work harder. It made everybody working for Sharice because they were trying to say we were corporate. And Sharice's car has all of the lights on on them and she has to like get it fixed. And we're like, she is not corporate. It made everybody on the campaign work 10 times harder. But the primary as a whole made us better. It made us more disciplined. and. It doesn't hurt when you're on TV for a month in a primary and you don't stop TV in any real way from July all the way to the till November. Okay. Uh, CJ, what was Congressman Yoder's path to victory in this election? Yeah, well, kind of talking a little bit more tactically, um, so our objective basically was to form, to combine two groups of people in the third district um, that happened to be diametrically opposed to each other. Uh, form those into a coalition that, that would make up a majority and give us a victory. It made basically 43 to 45 percent of the district who loves President Trump, uh, tends to be conservative Republicans, uh, and then about 8 to 10 or 12 percent of the district, which is sort of your moderate kind of Melissa Rooker, uh, Barbara Bollier type Republican uh, who very much opposes President Trump. And we could not win, and obviously we did not win, uh, without both of those coalitions and the, and the uh, sort of uh, moderate Republican coalition just never came home for us. Um, but th the goal from the outset was to uh, both uh, hold the, the base and to win over. And we had, Kevin had won those moderate Republicans uh, handily in the past. I mean, he's significantly outperformed other uh, up and down ballot Republicans in Johnson County in the third district in past elections. Um, 2014, he had uh, Sam Brownback and Pat Roberts on the ballot, and, and we, uh, he outperformed them, I think, by close to 20 points. Uh, in 2016, obviously, we had President Trump, and he outperformed President Trump by, uh, I think, 13 or 14 points. Um, and so we were kind of uh, banking on that happening again, and uh, that was the goal, was to, to keep those folks. Uh, and at the end of the day, they just, they, they did not come home for us. Uh, and it mainly was because, uh, as we saw with a lot of these house races across the country, uh, we just couldn't break it away from the national, the national uh, discussion. Um, just a couple of numbers that, I, that I've been looking at and were kind of interesting. Um, the final daily tracking poll that we had on November 3rd to the 5th, uh, President Trump's approval rating was 43 approved, 53 disapprove. If you'll remember, our margin was Kevin got 44 and Sharice got 53. You know, it's basically one point off from the president's approval rating. And the national House uh, vote was, was very similar. It was Republicans that took 44% nationally and um, Democrats took 53% nationally. So our race in the third district was, in my view, an unfortunate microcosm of the, the national environment and um, essentially not much that we could do or say. I, mean, I, I would argue Kevin's built a, a fairly independent brand uh, in, during his career. He's, he's um, been a very big supporter of public education and um, you know, early childhood education programs and medical research and things that you don't hear from maybe a Kobach Republican or a Trump Republican. Um, but none of that 
seem to matter at the end of the day. And I kind of have taken it to calling this the Steve Rose problem, and I've got a quote here from his <laughs> column. It says, I've come to the painful decision that I cannot vote for Kevin Yoder for a fifth term representing Kansas' third congressional district. I have always voted for him in the past, but casting a ballot for Yoder in a November 6th election would feel like I am aiding and abetting President Donald Trump. And that's just, that's that 8 to 12 percent of the electorate uh, really just felt like Steve Rose. And, and um, no matter what message we delivered to them, uh, no matter how uh, many hands that uh, Kevin went out and shook and how many parades we walked in and um, how, how uh, evidently we tried to localize the race and emphasize uh, Kevin's local ties and his um, career in public service. Um, you know, he's been an elected official in Johnson County for 16 years. Uh, devoted his entire life, really, his entire adult life to serving the community. And at the end of the day, it, it was a national race. Uh, and, and that's not uncommon. I mean, you have um, historically, uh, presidents lose an average of 25 seats in their first midterms. And, and when their approval rating is below 50, they lose an average of 37 seats. And so that's obviously President Trump has been pretty consistently below 50% approval rating. And, uh, and you saw him lose I don't know what the exact, Patrick may know the exact count 40, now, but it's 40. Yeah. California 21 is going to flip. Yeah, so yeah. at the end of the day, it, it just became a national race, and, um, and we couldn't break it away. So we what? did not have a path to victory, to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> what thoughts do some of the rest of you have? What so thoughts do some of the rest of you have going about what you thought about these two House races going into the general election, not, not today, not looking backwards, but what did some of the rest of you think about how these races looked? Well, I, I was going to say, you know, the thing, the, the thing you could feel, um, kind of the feel of the 3rd District was set by, I think, early October. And, and there was a sense that it didn't matter what Yoder said, and even if there had been 18 debates, that it didn't matter what he what issues he raised, it was, it was, it was a strange, because by all odds, and this is what was so unusual about this year, uh, a candidate with the profile that Cherise Davids had, um, not only would she not have been considered anywhere close to likely to win even two years ago, I mean, she wouldn't have even been in the mix of candidates. And, and that, that to me is supremely interesting. The, the second district, what's interesting is you're getting a lot of discussion, and you, you've gotten this in the gubernatorial race, too, of what did Davis do wrong? Uh, was he too cautious? Should he have mentioned Pelosi at the outset, albeit as so he's not a vote for Pelosi, but always with Republicans just saying the name reminds them that Pelosi is out there. All of those things, and I'm struck by what Stephen Ambrose said, which is, no, he lost a close election, and the numbers we're seeing now suggest it might have been within a percentage point. And so it was just a close election. The Republican was relatively unknown. The Democrat very well known in a Republican-leaning district. Um, that, to me, turned out, the second district turned out to be a little more interesting race because of the work that Watkins had to do to win over his his fellow Republicans. So, okay. Any other thought? I think if we look okay. at districts nationally like this, put put Kansas in context, right? So the Republicans went in defending what about two dozen seats that Clinton held, and in practice, that was a death sentence for those Republicans. They were just wiped out in those seats. They they hold three Clinton districts that they that they won barely. Most of them went to recounts. So in, in that sense, yeah, I mean, there probably wasn't that much Yoder could have done realistically to win the election. And, and that went beyond Yoder. Right? I mean, you look at districts like the third that had been quite safe for Republicans for some time, they flip over to a Democrat. Those losses for Republicans extended down ballot to state legislature, city council, school boards. Um, and, and I think that that kind of category of district fits into the kind of suburban trend we're seeing that really is the underappreciated counterpoint to the Rust Belt flipping to Trump. I mean, we don't pay as much attention to districts in the, not, well, district, but counties, large, large suburban, wealthier, educated counties that actually Clinton picked up 
and Romney had one, or a district like a, a county like Johnson County that goes from an 18-point Romney win to a two and a half point Trump win. Uh, you, you know, so I, I think there was just a very interesting category of seats out there like that that 20 years ago would have been bedrock Republican suburbia, but because of how whites are realigning along education lines, they are the new swing territory. Whereas the second. You know, this is a district that Trump won by 19, 20 points. It's typically a 60, 40 Republican district. It's, I mean, to Paul Davis's credit, he made it competitive. Um, but, you know, this is not a category of district that Democrats did very well in. Democrats did well at, at picking up districts that Trump won by less than 10 points. They only picked up like two or three Trump double digit districts. So this was just a very hard category of, of seat to put this in, in, in context. But you know, I also think coming back to some of these candidates in terms of over and underestimating, you know, I think sometimes candidates get overestimated. I think we might have overestimated Paul Davis's ability to overcome the Republicanness of the district, overestimated Yoder's ability to survive in this kind of environment, but also conversely <laughs> underestimated, you know, Sharice Davids and Watkins. You know, I think of I'm not sure this ever got published, but there was a comment that a reporter told me from a Republican con political consultant in Johnson County that Sharice Davids was, pardon my language, a Democrat's orgasm because she, she, she checked off every single demographic box that should make a liberal go crazy. <laughs> but that's really insulting. I mean, and that reduces yeah. her or any kind of candidate where you, you just put them in that box and you don't really recognize the strengths that they bring to that race, like clearly Watkins and, and, and Davids did. They were able to generate some enthusiasm. You know, they clearly had a compelling story for some people. And they brought a lot more to the race than just party and what box you want to put them in. So I think that's something that we don't appreciate enough about those two races. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's one reason why, uh, you know, Dan talking about the focus on message, I think, uh, was so fascinating to me because I think you guys had a really compelling story to tell. You had quite a good story. Let, let's talk about key environmental factors in these, U, in these two U.S. House races. I mean, we'll start with the obvious one, President Trump. So in our race, we tried as hard not to talk about uh, President Trump. We, we did. I mean, like, like he said, President Trump won our district 18, 19 points or something like that in 2016. Uh, so we went out of our way to try not to. Now, t to their credit, they did everything they could to talk about him by bringing him here, right? And, and <laughs> Vice President Pence was here, and you know, um, the, the whole cavalry came in. But you know, we try to make this race as much as not about President Trump, but about Washington and about what's going on in Washington and fixing the culture and the corruption in Washington instead of making it focus on just "quote unquote" President Trump. Okay, I will say I will say they did a great job on that regard. I mean, Steve Watkins is the quintessential outsider, uh, but it felt like by, you know, October that we were like the insider and Davis was like, yeah, he was running against DC. He wouldn't have known that he'd spent his entire life as a insider, you know? So, um, so, so that really was uh, an effective job. And I, I, but, um, I, you know, the Trump um, coming, we, we had two problems. One, one was a problem had you know across the, the nation, which is actually getting Trump voters to not to, to turn out. So we we had Trump voters support from the primary that was like ingrained, but we needed to get them to turn out. Well, getting the guy to show up <clears throat> is a pretty good way to get him to turn out. So, um, but also we also the second problem to to CJ's yeah that we had the same uh, we didn't have as many we had more Trump supporters, but we have the issue with sort of the traditional. Len Jenkins, Bob Dole Republican, who consider themselves Republicans first and Trump supporters second, if at all. Um, and then, um, and so you gotta, you gotta kinda, kinda walk the line with em embracing Trump, but maybe changing your rhetoric a little bit. Um, you don't talk about drain the, you know, the, the drain the, you don't use his words, you know? You, you don't run away from any of his themes, but you, don't, but you can change the way you talk and the way you message um, and, your, and, and focus on more traditional Republican talking points of lower taxes, uh, lower regulation, e economic themes, border security, as, as, a, as opposed to just straight build the wall, even though he is for building the wall. You know, so um, it's that kind of stuff. I think um, Kevin Yoder and CJ, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Kevin Yoder faced a really interesting um, 
dilemma or situation when it came to the support of the Trump administration because directly across the state line was um, Senator-elect Josh Hawley, who did not shy away from um, the president, in fact, walked off Air Force One in like the, the five days preceding that election in Columbia, Missouri. Um, and it, it often came up several times, um, especially in, on Weekend Review. Um, Dave and I both noted that, you, you know, um, Yoder was not there the first time the administration kind of made their footprint in the Kansas City area, even though um, there was some discussion about fundraising at that point. So I, I don't, I'm always looking at it kind of through the lens of our viewers and the questions that the viewers are asking me, but a lot of them wanted to know, well, why is Josh Hawley, who's just across the state line, um, you know, so closely tied to the president's visits and um, Congressman Yoder was not. And so I don't know if, if you saw any trickle over or anything like that, PJ. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Kevin was never going to run away from the president. I mean, he was never going to be a, like a Jeff Flake or um, someone like that. Just It's just not who he is. You know, he never went to D.C. to battle with presidents, whether it's, I think he's used, basically used this exact phrase, with a, whether it was Obama or whether it was Trump, he never felt like his job was to fight uh, a presidential administration. It was to try to find ways to work with them, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. Um, obviously, there were much, m many more avenues in a Republican administration for him to work with, just being a Republican. But there were certainly a few avenues that, where he worked with the, with President Obama. Um, and so, I mean, he flew on Air Force One with President Trump when he came for the VFW uh, National Convention. And um, as I forget which, there was a litany of outside groups that uh, spent money in this race. So I can't remember which one it was exactly, but there was an, one of the ads was um, when President Trump said Kevin Yoder's an incredible guy, and they literally ran a 30-second <laughs> ad, and I think just on repeat, yeah. Trump saying Kevin Yoder's an incredible guy. But so he was never, I mean, he was never going to shy away from him, uh, but, um, you know, he wasn't, on the flip side, he was never uh, going to be sort of your full-throated um, support and defend President Trump no matter what he does or says and goes, you know, he, it's just, again, just not who Kevin is. He's not a, he's not a firebrand. He's not somebody who spends a lot of his time um, making TV appearances on Fox or anything. Or um, he, He's just more interested in doing the job and, and trying to, um, you know, find solutions to, to problems. Um, so it was always sort of a, a, a little bit of a weird, there was never really a, a you just, you know, maybe Jared or somebody would consult in the consultant class would say you got to pick your lane, either be a big, tr big time Trump guy or or a Jeff Flake never Trumper. And uh, Kevin just didn't ever fit into either of those um, uh, in either of those lanes, and it just because really just wasn't who he is. Yeah, and outside groups were definitely very helpful in reminding everyone that the 92 percent of the time he voted for President Trump. The other thing that was hard for you guys is like Donald Trump would just tweet his support. Like, there were multiple times where I was like, is this fake? Like, is this just someone, like, one of our supporters in my Twitter feed, like, making a joke? And no, like, Donald Trump, he did, the only favor he did was he didn't mention you at his rally in Topeka. Mm -hmm. But other than that, he, like, tweeted at you guys and was say, was literally not being very hopeful uh, in yeah, I mean, that respect. Yeah, I mean, in a way, but in the, on the other hand, the, there's that 43 to 45% of people who really love the president. And so it... it it was always that double-edged sword where it would it would help us in certain ways and it would hurt us in other ways and um, you know that's part of the reason why just it, tactically speaking we, we were never going to run away from him fully because then you you condemn yourself to a political death right I mean we would have guaranteed a loss that's why Jeff Flake didn't run again in Arizona because he found himself in a 25 percent approval rating or something like that and it was largely Democrats who were approving of him. It seems like this problem just happens over and over and over again because it's the same thing with ACA in 2010 with President Obama like Democrats in hard races didn't want to have Obama's brand in 2010 because it was that like re-election he had just been elected and he had done something and people wanted a change and it was almost the same thing here where what do you do when the standard bearer of your party is just not popular and how do you keep going and there who are the two that the two clinton districts that survived oh uh will her in Herd texas, texas um, fitzpatrick, fitzpatrick in pennsylvania one and catco in New York, yes, yeah. New York, New York 24. Yeah. and Valadeo may survive in California, but yeah. it's I think his challenger <laughs> just took a lead. Yeah, no, he's trailing. 
Yeah. No. I don't think they've called it yet, but no. you know, they've like more updates. Yeah. Okay. What were some other environmental factors that were key in those races? I mean, how did the economy affect those two house races? If I could maybe not, I mean, steer that a different way. I mean, having lived in the second and been bombarded by the messaging in that, I mean, I, de I definitely saw like Davis wasn't talking about Trump. I mean, I, I think I, I saw that. I don't recall seeing a lot out of the Watkins campaign itself, but what I did see, and maybe this is how I get targeted, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube in the background, I mean, playing music videos or something while I'm working, and, and there were literally times I would count where I would see seven or eight back-to-back -back congressional leadership funds with Paul Davis and dancing strippers. Um, and there were times I just stopped watching YouTube, like literally, because I Our didn't... debate was just like that. I was trying to watch our debate, the last one, on TV, and I mean, on online, and it was like any break between Laura Orman and Koba talking was like yeah. seven ads. <laughs> well, like I just gave up. CLS. But, but yeah. what I found curious about that is like, literally that is almost the only thing I got in my mailbox or saw online about Paul Davis or about, if I'm, or aligned with the Watkins campaign. And you know, the mail that, that I saw from Davis was very much about like social security, some issues like that. But I was surprised, and maybe I just missed it because of how I'm targeted, that he didn't go after, I think, the, phrase this politely, the, the character and honesty issues that became issues with, with Watkins. Well, he, like, had, I didn't see that he had surrogates doing that. I mean, yeah. the Democratic Party put out this mailer late in the campaign, and it had the, the, the picture of Steve Watkins with a very long yeah. Pinocchio nose, and you flipped it over, and it said Steve Watkins, and in tiny print it said, if that is his real name. <laughs> And, and yeah, I mean, you, the, yeah, you had Democratic groups doing that on a, I mean, I remember. Well, that was them. I mean, that was the Watkins. I mean, that was the Davis campaign just funneling their money through the Kansas Democrat Party. That's, uh, at that's at any rate, I mean, he's asking about raising the character issue. I mean, you know, I remember my brother saying, who am I going to vote for? Davis, failed liberal politician, and Pelosi rubber stamp Paul Davis, or liar, liar Steve Watkins? I don't know. Um, so the messaging, guys, the messaging did resonate. <laughs> okay. It I mean, didn't help voters, but it resonated. Well, like, totally anecdotal. Like, I was having uh, on my doorstep on Halloween, a friend came over with her daughter, and they watched a lot of children's videos on YouTube at night talking about politics. Paul Davis came up, and like the little four or five year old kid literally asked something to the effect of, Mommy is that the stripper man? <laughs> like little kids were, I mean, that's how saturated that was. So I was just surprised not to, again, maybe I missed it, see Davis hit back harder in a way that maybe he could have. Yeah, we, I mean, we made a very calculated decision early on um, that we knew that we needed to, one, define Paul Davis because we knew that this race was going to be a lot more about Paul Davis than it was about Steve Watkins, right? And so the kind of late attempt you see, or late attacks you saw on kind of Watkins character, character type of attacks, was something that we had strategized and planned on doing, but we knew that we had to let people know what Paul Davis stood for up front, right? So we did a lot of health care pieces, we did a lot of social security mm -hmm. pieces, we did a lot of education type of pieces and a lot of that type of messaging, or the bipartisan um, ads that you might have seen ran. But, yeah. you know, our, our thought process up front were, let's let everybody know where Paul Davis is, who Paul Davis is, and remind them who Paul Davis is, because Paul Davis had not been on the ballot or ran or held office for four years. We had to remind people who, who Paul Davis was before we could then turn around and start attacking Steve Watkins with our mind. Well, I, I do have a question about that because sure. um, one of the strains I've heard from some Democrats recently is that the problem was was that Paul was, in, in their minds, that, that he was running as a centrist and as, in their words, GOP light, and that if he had I mean, he, as a legislator, he represented a district here in Lawrence that, that was left of center. And th the argument was that this was a year that voters wanted you to be on one side of that divide or the other. Either you were a Republican and you were right of center, or you were a Democrat and you were left of center progressive, and he was trying to straddle the middle. Do you think, in retrospect, had he run left of center, he would have done any better? Yeah, it, it's funny you say that because, Pat, it's funny you guys also, we even heard Watkins start saying something like that. Watkins, I think, at some point mentioned how, how Paul was like a Republican light or running as a Republican. Um, the thing that I feel like we learned 
early on in this campaign or just kind of looking at previous election cycles was it was going to be important for Paul Davis to be who Paul Davis is, right? Paul Davis really is that middle of the road guy. He really is that bipartisan guy. And the thing that we knew was most important in this campaign, even more important than winning, was being who you really are. And that's the type of race that Paul wanted to run. Whether he ended up winning or losing, he wanted to be that guy that was going to reach across the aisle on both sides and work with both parties. And the guy that's going to say, when President Trump is right, I'm going to say he's right. But when he's wrong, I'm going to call him out. Um, so, you know, looking back, maybe, maybe if Paul would have ran more to the left or, you know, decided he But was Watkins be, also said that. He said, I call balls and strikes on President Trump. The stuff he liked, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll praise him for the border stuff, national security, Iraq, North Korea, the stuff I don't like, tariffs, which came up in a debate. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, he said that. I mean, I'm also curious whether you thought you would be running against Watkins, because it was pretty clear to me from May on, the, the, the first interview I had with Watkins, I came away with it, and I think I told you this, Hunter, that guy's going to win the primary. Um, and, you know, there was a lot, there were a lot of Republican talk saying, no, no, no. And, and it's like, no, the military profile, the outsider thing, that's a very, very attractive thing. Yeah. In this, no, completely this honest race. with you, we did not think until probably ju late July, we did not think that we were going to be running against Steve Watkins. We thought, you know, for sure it'd be one of the state senators that would probably come through. And that, that would have been easier, right? Well, I, I don't know if I'd say easier, right? <laughs> it'd be different. It'd be a little bit different of a race, but I definitely wouldn't. I don't know if I could say it would be easier. It would have been different, for sure. Although, to your question, your previous question about if he had run, uh, Davis had run a more, I guess, progressive campaign, if you will. I mean, I, I don't know how many progressives in the room want to raise their hand and let me know that they would have, that they voted for Steve Watkins because D Davis didn't run a progressive enough right. campaign. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm guessing that's not well, the case. Well, it's just that, <laughs> yeah, no, you know, as, as I said, Stephen Ambrose said, you know, if, when a candidate loses a close race, everything is viewed through the prism of all these things he did wrong, whereas if 1% of the vote had flipped, everything that he'd done wrong would show how, what a genius he was. Yeah. Sure. I do want to backtrack on, on one thing, though. When you look at this race, I mean, I think, Patrick, you said that this is a 60-40 Republican district. Typically, yeah. So, I mean, this was by no means a slam dunk for Republicans. I mean, I think it was within a percent now in terms of the final. Yeah. So, you know, this this primary field, I think, was the most qualified primary field I've ever seen, you know, in terms you had a, you know, two, what, two state senators, a state rep, a former House speaker. So, you know, Watkins coming in with this unknown brand obviously was able to win out. Obviously, that was helped by, I mean, I'm not sure what the final tally was, but I think his father put in mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars into his race. Um, and what was fascinating to me, though, was, you know, let's say, you know, if it's Karen Tyson or somebody, you know, the state senator, or Steve Fitzgerald isn't more of a slam dunk. But the, the thing that I always enjoy most about, and this goes for both the third and the second, um, and I know John enjoys this too, just going out and talking to voters, you know, we, you know, we always kind of think, okay, voters are incredibly wise, and in reality, they kind of have a very blunt assessment. You know, why do you vote for somebody? Well, they're pro-life. Oh, this person's pro-choice. I don't want to vote for them. And it was fascinating for me talking to the voters who were supporting Watkins. I'd gone down to a debate, uh, I think it was the first debate in the second district uh, between uh, Davis and Watkins, and, you know, he, the Republicans in the room were sort of like, well, you know, if we don't, there was one that said, well, if he, you know, we're, I'm going to vote for him. If we don't like him in two years, I'll primary him. To me, that just kind of showed, okay, there's still some of that dissension. I know um, Pat talked about the ad, or not the ad, the letter that was signed off on by the district chair saying, okay, you know, we have issues with him pre-primary. I went through and called people on that letter, and they mostly said, you know, no, we're, we're happy with him. You know, that meeting that you talked about did do did, was successful in kind of winning a lot of them over, but it was clear talking to voters, again, you're winning within a percent. That support is still kind of soft in that Republican district. So I, I'm not sure if the Democrats could have found a, you know, a better Democrat candidate than Paul Davis to challenge uh, the Republican in this district, but you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Watkins, you know, if somebody like Tyson or um, Kevin Jones would have done be could have done better than um, Steve Watkins. Well, but those those Republicans also now that Watkins is the congressman, I mean, I think, you know, barring a, a wrong vote or something else, I mean, if he has decent constituent services and does good staff work and votes generally in line with the way Republicans like, that's whatever softness remains in the Republican Party is probably going to go away. Um, I mean, it, it happened... It happened with Jim Ryan. Um, it happened with Lynn Jenkins. 
Um, and it will probably happen here. That's the way it, it tends to. Okay. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, races that we haven't discussed in detail today, and I'm kind of curious to get everybody's reaction. Down ballot um, was not a great day for Democrats. It, it appeared as if, uh, based on uh, Governor-elect Kelly's campaign, it appeared that Democrats may, and I think it was widely perceived that there were uh, races in the constitutional offices, especially the Secretary of State race, that were going to be far more competitive than they wound up being. What's your assessment of that? I mean, I think we were, most people are probably realistic, no offense to any candidates, uh, we're really just only, only looking at the Secretary of State's race for down ballot constitutional. And, you know, what little public polling there was in that race, Scott Schwab always had a modest lead. It ended up being a modest lead. I, I think what was unusual about that race, looking at constitutional races before, is that, you know, for Democrats in Kansas, I mean, yeah, you're the minority party, but losing often becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you nominate people who don't actually campaign and don't raise money, but they make you feel good oftentimes, but they're not out there as serious contenders. And Brian McClendon clearly showed he was a serious contender by the money that he brought in and the messaging. And I think that that helped bring our attention to that race, obviously. Uh, but I think it also is harder to get people to pay attention to necessarily the candidates and the issues in a race down, down ballot like that. You know, when you have a state like Kansas or Massachusetts that naturally leans to a party, when they elect that minority party as anything, it's typically actually the governorship because that's where you can get the voters to actually look at the candidates, look at the issues. Whereas, you know, they, do, they may do better down ballot, but voters are coming back to party oftentimes. Yeah. So I, I don't necessarily read that it was, it was a bad day necessarily for Democrats down ballot. It was never gonna be a good day, um, realistically. Um, and I think it, you look at the legislative seats that flipped, if we're talking about that, none of them were actually surprising. If you look at the fundamentals of the districts, they were all districts flipping back to the party that naturally favored them. Like Melissa Rooker held a Democratic district. Uh, she was practically the only Republican who has won there at any level since it was drawn. Just like the Democratic incumbents that lost were, were typically the Democratic aberrations in otherwise quite Republican districts. Um, so I don't think there was anything particularly surprising in that. I just, I mean, I would make, the, the first note I would make is, and again, no offense to any statewide elected officials, but the bottom line is governor counts more than all of the other statewide elected offices combined. That's, I mean, in terms of its power, in terms of what it can do. So, but, and yeah, Secretary of State was seen as kind of the one that Democrats could flip if the wave got, the wave got big enough. But, you know, a Democrat hasn't won that in a competitive election in 70 years, and uh, the apocryphal story is it was by mistake because both <laughs> candidates had the same last name, and uh, <laughs> Larry, had, uh, Frank and Larry Ryan or something like that. And th those down ballot races, unless you, you know, you have a very unpopular incumbent, uh, 94 insurance commissioner's race, Ron Todd comes to mind. You'd had the whole, uh, the previous commissioner had gotten a big workers' compensation award for lifting his briefcase out of the trunk of a car. Um, and Sebelius ran on not being a, a, a lackey of the industry and started her career. Unless you have something like that, it's very hard for Democrats to win those races. I will say, in the third, the Democrats were pretty successful. I mean, oh yeah, you know, uh, Kelly. I think the combination of Kelly and David's turning voters out. You know, they flipped Rooker, they flipped Gallagher. I was going to um, say the Susan Ruiz race that caught me by surprise yeah. when I came in and I found that Susan Ruiz was a state representative elect standing in our ballroom. I was like, wow, that wasn't even on my radar. But again, Linda Gallagher in what's actually a Democratic district. Yeah, yeah. it's true. But they were able to hold it in past cycles right. in different environments. And I think the, the enthusiasm among Democrats, um, I think probably a lot of Democrats maybe even like Linda Gallagher and Melissa Rooker, and, and they just didn't, frankly, didn't care. It, it was about, um, I think, going to the ballot box to vote against the president and against uh, Secretary Kobach, and they didn't feel the need to, they just went straight 
Democrat. And I think that, and you, you, I mean, Osterhaus and um, Schaefer losing on the county commission too. That's, yeah. they're nonpartisan races, but. Well, nonpartisan. Yeah. In they're all really actually partisan. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, I, Jared, did you want to? Yeah, just a couple of quick comments, just on the the Secretary of State's race. First of all, I think, I, th I, um, I think Schwab's closing message, uh, from the standpoint of really taking partisan politics out of the office, um, really helped smooth his pathway there from the standpoint of those those final swing voters um, that were really crucial in that race. Um, I would agree with Patrick on the. The assessment on the the ledge races in terms of them pivoting back to to their their party so to speak but i think one thing that's interesting as you start kind of looking at some of those uh is for example ed trimmer down in southeast kansas you're talking about somebody that had survived 2010 2012 very um very uh, strongly republican years and to um, to go down in a in a cycle that was um, much more favorable to Democrats overall, um, that uh, that that so so to speak that blue wave I think was really consolidated inside of the the 35 435 corridor of, of Johnson County and once you got outside of that um, it really it really wasn't nearly as strong and I think you could even make the case. Um, when you're looking back at the the 2010 2012 type cycles that as you move further out west in state that in some ways it's becoming it's becoming more conservative uh from the standpoint of of those those returns and just from an overall environment standpoint um i think one thing that was interesting to me and that i don't think probably got as much coverage and i may be somewhat alone in this thinking but there's a lot of the, the national story narrative centered around, especially in some of the big Senate races of, uh, over the, the Kavanaugh hearings and different things like that. And it just seemed to me that, especially in those areas of the second district, those rural areas where there was bleed over with the Missouri Senate race, with the Missouri TV market, that there was a, there was a hardening of the Republican electorate and there was more motivation behind the Republican electorate. Um, I don't know that I would agree that that was helpful inside of CD3, but I think especially inside of the rural areas of CD2, um, that created so, some energy and so forth there. Um, but I think the, uh, the other thing just on the ledge level is, um, CJ brought this up earlier relative, I mean, there was, there was a fairly calculated effort on the part of Republicans to not drive the, the education debate. And I think that was largely successful. Um, in ter especially outside of Johnson County, and being able to win those races on on other issues outside of that that issue set, I think was was really important. Okay, I have one final question, and then, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, you might want to go ahead and quietly queue up over at the microphone over there. But my question, and Jordy, I've got to ask you this question first, but uh, I want everyone else who has an opinion. Uh, to ask as well. Um, Governor-elect Kelly uh, won a pretty convincing uh, election, very convincing election, uh, but now she faces a GOP legislature. How's that going to turn out? Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, one, my expertise is getting her there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, to, no, I'm no, just kidding. Uh, no, I mean, I think she has a reputation that I think and we've already seen this so far in the in the transition period is that she has a reputation of working across the aisle. She has a reputation of working hard to get what's done right for Kansans. And I think that uh, Senator Kelly is really willing to work with whomever if, if and I think, and it, it feels so far uh, that there are things that have happened in the Republican legislature uh, before that have, you know, for example, Medicaid expansion passing and, and obviously rolling back the brown bat tax cuts. Those things happened uh, that Senator Kelly was a big part, or Medicaid expansion, of course, of course has not happened, but passing it through the houses has. Uh, and I just, I think that it's not only about political power, it's about her, her, her true desire to work towards 
to fix the mess, fix this mess that's been created. And and there's a lot of people that want to help that. And I think the parties don't seem to matter as much. And maybe that's super idealistic or whatever. But it, it does genuinely feel that way being a part of the transition. So I'm hopeful about what what she'll be able to accomplish. And I think that she truly understands how to get it done. So. You know, one thing I'll say is that as Kansas Democrats, that's all you have to know how to do that, right? I mean, we are always in the minority. So whether it's, you know, being governor or whether it's being a member of the House or the Senate or whether it's almost being a member of Congress, you almost have to be able to work with the other side. That's what, that, what Governor, Ke governor Wright Kelly is known to do and has done for the entire career. Well, I'll be honest. I, don't, I do not envy uh, governor Elect Kelly. I think she's going to have a pretty tough task. Um, <laughs> Well, because when you look, I mean, the key thing about these legislative races, you know, Democrats, you know, did well in 16 in state house races. And then, you know, this time they did, you know, we talk, obviously we talked about Melissa Rucker, Linda Gallagher, where they did knock out some key moderates, you know, but they also lost a lot, a lot of their, you know, I think they had one Western candidacy. They lost, the, and they lost that. They did bet, so they gained seats in the suburbs, lost them across the state. So I think, um, and somebody can correct me here, I think they're still at 40. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. That's right. So you know they didn't they didn't actually gain any seats. What has happened now is you know there was a very you know st strong moderate uh, contingent within their House Re Republican caucus. That's been largely gutted now. And I talked to uh, Representative Kathy Wolfmore. She's the, the KCK Democrat uh, who's the lead budget negotiator for the Dems on House appropriations. And she's like the middle's been carved out. You you know everybody's kind of back in their corner now. So you have you know you have conservatives who now have more power in the House fewer moderates, you know, so, and when you look at it, I mean, are you going to have a House Majority Leader, the person responsible for bringing bills to the floor, who's a moderate like Don Hyman is? I'm, you know, he's going to face a pretty strong challenge to his role. So the moderates aren't going to have much to play for, you know, in the House. The Senate is still a little more murky because a lot of moderates won in 16, but Susan Wagle and Jim Denning still, you know, really very much control that chamber. Um, Kelly, you know, does have the benefit. I, I don't want to say this is a scenario where you want, you know, Laura Kelly as your governor if you're a Democrat, because obviously you prefer to have more Dems and more mods. But, you know, she spent so much time as the budget negotiator for Senate, you know, Ways and Means. So she knows how to negotiate the Republicans, obviously kind of, you know, and please Democrats at the same time. Her and Senate Minority Leader Anthony Hensley are obviously very close. So you get the sense she's going to, you know, she knows how to do this. It's just a matter of how much is Susan Wagle going to work with her, how much is Ron Reichman, the House Speaker, going to work with her? And I think Wagle has been pretty clear about, you know, kind of vowing she wants, you know, conservative legislation. And, you know, does that mean Reichman's in the person negotiating? I'm not sure. So you have two very strong conservatives and, you know, a new governor. That's that's a pretty interesting recipe. The day after the election, I talked to some moderates in Johnson County because I wanted to get that question answered about, you know, what this is going to look like. And the thing that I found most fascinating was what they're going to be doing between the you know, the day after the election and the day the legislative session gets started, a lot of them said it's just going to be a lot of introductory work, you know, reaching across the aisle, trying to reform some semblance of a coalition, trying to find the people that they could rely on, um, whether they're new, um, newly elected or maybe they've been around for a while, and it's just re-driving uh, those inroads, trying to map out exactly uh, uh, what a base line looks like for a newly mapped legislature. I think that's something that um, voters in Johnson County especially are going to have to be very aware of. Um, I think, in at least from what I'm hearing, um, is that things that they may be used to, even though they ought, this is obviously their vote, their voice, the things they may be used to seeing from some of their um, elected moderates may not happen this session. Um, and I think um, it could feel like ice water for at least a little while where they're trying to adjust to the, to the new makeup. But I think if you look at the numbers, you know, the Republican caucus does get more conservative, but they don't have the votes to run the place by themselves. I mean, there has to be compromise between all of these factions. You know, I think we've heard a lot of sobbing from moderate Republicans after the election. They're going to have to adapt. I mean, both politically in the legislature, but also electorally. I mean, they've shown that they can win in any kind of district, all the way from Don Heineman, who has Trump's best legislative district in the state, to people like Melissa Rooker, who won by getting Democrats to vote for her. And I think going forward for them, both in and outside of the legislature, you know, they have to think about what, what and where their future is. Uh, electorally, is their future going to be trying to win back seats inside 435, where you could win as a liberal to moderate Republican 
you know, you, you were where the voters were on issues, but you had that Republican brand, but that's not working anymore because they want Democrats. Are you going to run there? Are you going to speak to that constituency? Are you going to go run primaries in Olathe or Southeast Kansas where you don't even try to challenge conservative Republicans, but where a Democrat can't win? So, I mean, I think for that faction there, which I guess we've talked about less, they have a, a lot of thinking about how they're going to adapt, you know, to both the current and future reality of politics in the state. Okay, I want to get to Q&A. We have at least four questions. I'd like to at least get through those four. So um, everybody, please ask a brief question. If you want to direct it to a particular person, you can. If you'd rather just ask it of the panel, that's fan fine, too. Go right ahead. My name is Christy Harlan. I want to thank Carrie and Patrick for the points about Democrats being um, minorities. I was the uh, communications director for Allen Law Police, the candidate for Congress in Kansas first. We won 32 percent. <laughs> That's good um, for a Democrat in that hey, district, actually. That is good. <laughs> I wanted to ask um, for the people on the campaign that got the attention of the national political committees, uh, thinking specifically the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the Democratic National Committee, and the counterparts on the Republican, um, and yes, I'm looking at Mr. Yoder's campaign manager. What effect did the, the parties especially the Democrats being involved in the Kansas campaigns this year. Any effect? Um, no effect? Well, How'd it work? I can take that one. This is a bit of a sore subject for me. Um, <laughs> and, and that's because I don't know if, if you all haven't followed it or you didn't follow it at the time. Um, so just to give you a bit of a, some context here, the National Republican Congressional Committee, which was the, is the Democrats' counterpart, the Washington Republicans, they had laid down a $1.2 million broadcast television buy that was set to begin on October 9th. Um, they canceled that buy uh, in late September. And just to give you an idea of how it affected us, uh, from October 9th through Election Day, all Democrat groups, so including the Davids campaign, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and various outside groups, spent $3.1 million on broadcast television in a four-week span. Republican groups, us and uh, the Congressional Leadership Fund that was mentioned, spent about 1.65. That difference is about $1.4 million. So that 1.2 that was canceled from the, the NRCC, actually, I think, you know, it's easy to armchair quarterback this, and, and you never know what may have happened. Maybe more Democratic money would have, would have come in. But I will tell you, we had an internal poll on October 10th that showed us tied 47-47. I don't know what... If, if Daniel had similar polling, but it, it was a lot closer in mid-October, uh, and when that, uh, that, that the National Republicans uh, kind of pulled the rug out from under us a bit there, uh, things really went south for us quickly just because we couldn't keep up with all the money that was coming in. Well, and CJ, isn't it also a psychological blow? Not only do you lose the money, you have people like me and my you colleagues in it. Washington <laughs> writing yeah. these stories like, oh, look at this. The NRCC <laughs> has pulled its ad. They must have no confidence in Yoder anymore or, yeah, you know, thanks whatever. Thanks a lot, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it it's didn't. It's like this, this thing that just kind of snowballs on you. Yeah, it certainly didn't help. And, you know, it, it sort of, uh, it froze up a little bit of money too, you know, uh, like Washington, some money in Washington and, and elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, seeing that, that sent a pretty lo you know, loud signal to other people that... Plus, Act Blue goes nuts. <laughs> right, so. yeah. Well, that, and that was part of it, is that, you know, you, you mentioned it. we were somewhat caught off guard by the, the, yeah. the size of the number, but we did anticipate that you guys would be able to raise a significant amount of money to, because of Act Blue. And, and we knowingly kept it quiet. We were... Who knew Act Blue would go... Like, Act Blue first reported what our number was. Um, and it was mm -hmm. $2.7 million <laughs> that we raised. Um, but um, I forget where I was going with that. But it did become easier to raise money um, after the, the primary. And it became easier to raise money when the NRCC pulled out because we were a little bit more of a sure, sure bet, right? We put that on our prospectus when we like would send it to donors. Um, as far as what did, like, Democratic groups, how did they control us? They were just another partner at the table that you talked to about your campaign and someone else who had been around the road that you could ask questions to. Um, there was no, everyone, it's actually funny, um, a lot of staff would come in and be like, someone just asked me if I'm paid for by the DCCC. 
Uh, and we weren't, none of us, I mean, I, one person was, but the rest of us weren't. And it's funny, we, there's this perception that they come in and they're like, you jump when I say how high, but it's more of a conversation, right? It's what donors are we calling today? How many hours of call time did we do? How many doors did we knock? What doors are we knocking? And they're, they're actually helpful because they've been through the process before. And it's always better to have more eyes in a situation to figure out how you can do better. They're definitely more helpful, I think, in a, in a challenger situation or a new yeah. candidate because, mm -hmm. you know, Kevin, we've, we've, uh, he, this was running for his fifth term, so he's done this four times before and pretty successfully. And, um, you know, the, the difference in this campaign in terms of why this, the one, the $1.2 million was such a, um, you know, maybe a death blow for us was that all of the outside money that was coming in on the other side. Not only was it Act Blue, it was, um, I think, League of Conservation Voters, and Michael Bloomberg, I think, spent $600,000 in the last couple of weeks, and you name it, there was like seven or eight groups coming in, uh, and we just, and all we had was the Congressional Leadership Fund, uh, which tried to fill that gap, that $1 million gap, but they, they hadn't accounted for it um, in their budgeting, so they just, they were having to kind of scramble and, and to help us out, but, um, that was really the issue. I mean, we raised as a campaign nearly $5 million uh, yeah, we over right the course as well. of the cycle, um, which, you know, and I think prior to the $2.7 million quarter, we had every quarter, whether in an off year or in an election year, Kevin has, I think, had the record for the most yeah. money, and we basically just would break records every quarter. And we. Well, it's funny because you guys put out a press release, and we were not ready to go with our number. Like, they had the act blue numbers and you put your press release out and we're like, oh, okay, I guess we should go now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the next question. I do want to mention we'll have representatives, very senior level representatives here next week from, the, from both of the Democratic and Republican House campaign committees. Alice? Um, okay, so um, I'd like to ask this question more about, a, I guess, a macro strategy. Um, one has to do with um, reducing the number of places you can vote. Um, I would call it voter suppression, but we're supposed to be nice, I guess, and I don't know what else to call it. Um, anyway, you know, uh, the example being um, what happened in Dodge City with one uh, voting place that was way outside of town. Um, the other has to do with uh, redistricting, which will be happening in two years, I think. Is that right? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I think there's a lot that we don't hear, you know, we, we little humans down here on the ground that um, more politically placed people do. And I'm wondering if you could talk about those two strategies and whether they're going to be and how they're going to be playing out in Kansas. Okay. Can I just, I just want to address redistricting because this is something that a um, little bit of a pet peeve of mine that comes up a lot. Um, there's a perception amongst Democrats in particular that Kansas <clears throat> has somehow gerrymandered these districts, and that's the reason why Republicans tend to win them. Um, the courts drew our maps. The Republicans didn't draw them. Democrats didn't draw them. The courts drew them. These are these are these are not gerrymandered. Now, now that Laura Kelly's in charge, maybe she can gerrymander them next time to make them better. But to be clear, they're not gerrymandered. These are drawn by the courts. So, yeah, I I, I think kind of ballparking the numbers, I think Kansas will keep a fourth district. I, I think we're inching towards that being on the borderline territory. Right. If not this next reapportionment losing it, I'd probably bet on it in 2030. But even if we keep four seats, there's, they're going to have to be changed. Like the third is going to have to shrink to account for the growth of Johnson County. I mean, what does it lose? Wyandotte, where does it lose it to? Kansas is second. Does it lose the Miami part to make the second more Republican? I mean, hard to say. So I think there are just a lot of moving parts there that we're not going to know until we actually see what the population dispersion looks like at that point. And of course, you know, where, what the political balance is of the players in that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I totally agree with, the, with, the, with what's going on with uh, certainly precincts. That's a new favorite game of election commissioners around the country. Um, in North Carolina, for example, taking um, T removing all election precincts from college campuses or any place you can reasonably walk to from a college campus is a favorite tactic in North Carolina now. Or you look at exact match in Georgia, um, where if 
the state has your record of, you know, Patrick R. Miller with a period, but whatever other form they're looking at doesn't have the period on the R, I'm exact matched out and I can't vote. Uh, and that is overwhelmingly affecting minorities in, in Georgia. Um, over 80%, I think, of people who are exact matched. We, don't, we haven't had that here yet. Um, but, I mean, there are a lot of issues out there, and I think, you know, the courts dealt Secretary Kobach a blow on, on that. I also wonder how many of the people who got caught up in the proof of citizenship uh, regulations, red tape, actually would have voted to begin with. Um, so there's a lot that we don't know about that, but there is a lot of, I think, very concerning things going on if you care about easy access to voting and, and access to registration that's reasonable. And that we actually, Jordy can attest to this because we were on the phone quite often at the end. We did a huge election protection program um, with aligned with Democrats and the, and the coordinated Brooklyn who's out here was helpful in that. But what happened was the reason why I became so like laser focused on it was in the primary, um, th the votes didn't come in. The machines broke. I, Hunter, I think you wrote about the Antioch the church situation. The machines didn't break. That I spent so much time talking about this. They didn't break. The it just took forever. Break. It was the, the USB that yeah, held the, the thing. Yeah, the getting the like, information from the machines to the reporting software was exponentially slower than expected by the Johnson County Elections Office. So nothing broke. The machines did not break. No. <laughs> They um, technically <laughs> didn't break, but they didn't work the way they were supposed to. Um, that is, and Ronnie that Metzger, is I do want to say. That is absolutely <laughs> accurate. <laughs> right? So maybe they didn't quite break, but they didn't work the way they were supposed to. And there were lots of questions when a bunch of us sat down with the election commissioners and just asked them simple questions about how things worked because we knew that we didn't want what happened in the primary to happen again. And second of all, um, this didn't make as much news, but there was an early vote site that was a police station in Wyandotte County, and it wouldn't move. And we tried to get it to move, but they wouldn't move it. So that wasn't as bad as Dodge City, but still not great. Well, and that's, I think that's going to be an issue in a discussion going forward, because now, um, you know, it's not just Dodge City, although that was the most, most visible because there was litigation and it was one polling place for a city of thousands. Um, but there are uh, lots of other places across the state where you've seen this consolidation of precinct and polling places. And, uh, you know, one argument is it's the ADA and you have to have everything accessible for the disabled or, or, and stuff like that. Um, it just, it, it raises the, it, it makes it clear how important uh, these issues surrounding how, the, that the issues of how America votes, with what machines, where, what the rules are, are, are very significant discussions. Okay, um, we're going to go on to our next question. We can have, we're going to do our three additional questions. Sound like my mic's off. Bill, do you want me? I think if you look at the Fox AP poll in Kansas, the environment wasn't a top issue for a whole lot of Kansans. I mean, for those that it was, they voted for Laura Kelly. Um, there were a lot of states where the environment in one way or another was a huge issue that actually did come up. I think when they had an issue, you know, I think of my home state of Virginia, we have, uh, see, you know, ocean communities literally going underwater. And Republican mayors talking about, we have to put buildings on stilts because our city's not gonna be here in 20 or 30 years. Um, that was an issue in a lot of races there or in Florida or California. I just don't think that we necessarily had the obvious pressing 
problem, I put that in air quotes, I guess, we have a lot of problems with the environment, but that really made that a top issue in any of our races. But I think you could look at the environment through the lens of a Kansas voter when they talk about agriculture, they talk about the water supply. Um, I mean, that was a big, just that those questions started to come up, um, not in the Johnson County debate so much, but in the state fair debate, you know, about the, the securing the future of agriculture here in the state, what we're gonna do about the Ogallala Aquifer, how we're gonna you know, um, make sure that the farms and the animals and um, have the water and the resources they need to continue a successful agrarian economy here. So even though we may not have heard a lot about the traditional um, environmental issues um, that you know, Patrick alluded to, I think if you look at, look at it through the lens of, of an agrarian state, we, we did hear about it. Well, but on the other hand, I mean, we're, I think what she's referring to is we had uh, it, during this campaign period and right after it, I mean, only last week, actually, the, the day before Thanksgiving, maybe, we had this report about how uh, from uh, the Trump administration, the agencies that talked about uh, a projection of how many billions of economic loss there would be from climate change. And then, you know, there was that point somewhere in the summer where there was an international report that, um, I don't want to be flip about it, but it suggested that essentially we're doomed, um, that we that the world hasn't done enough yet to combat climate change, and it, it could literally be too late. Um, and yeah, it is interesting that that was not um, a, a bigger issue, especially in, in federal races, and I, I don't know how to account for that, especially with what was supposed to be a blue wave, and because that is an issue that animates uh, liberal voters and younger voters a lot more. Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, my name is Tad Kramar, and I have a question about the future. Uh, 2020 will be a presidential election year. Normally that means a bigger turnout. Bigger turnout usually is more favorable to Democrats, and uh, in the second district, the margin was extremely close. I'm wondering if this bigger turnout in 2020 could make it a little easier or more likely for a Democrat to win the second district. Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for cussing our dreams, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm somewhat serious in that. Uh, the, uh, the, the turnout in 20, uh, 2018 versus 2016 was pretty, the, where it, where the, tur the reason why turnout was up so much was because in places like Lawrence and Topeka, the turnout was much higher than it typically is. So, the, so when you see the, so in the presidential, you should see the turnout go up more in the parts of the district where Republicans typically do better. So to be completely honest, no. I'm going to sort of disagree with that, just a little bit, right? Um, you know, one thing that I was actually had lunch with Paul last week, and we were talking about um, one thing that we were both hoping that the outcome of this race would do for the next election cycle is to not just show us, but show everybody that this race is winnable, right, for a Democrat, right? This race is a race that I hope that we continue to pay attention to in 2020, and especially in 2022 after redistricting. I'm really interested to see what happens with the second district versus the third district and what all happens with that. Uh, because I, who knows what this district will look like um, at that point. But um, I, I do think that, you know, with 2020 being a presidential year, like Pat was saying, there, there will be some higher turns out in some other areas that weren't as high, especially in the more rural areas. But you never know. Uh, if um, you get a good candidate and you never know what's going to happen with there not being an open seat, but there being an incumbent seat. Um, so that, there'll definitely be some different dynamics uh, that'll be at play. But I definitely think that there's still a possibility that it could be a, a good year and that a Democrat could potentially win this seat as well. Though, the one final point on that, uh, is, uh, Steve Watkins has the great honor of being a top three candidate, according to NBC News, a top three candidate in the nation of having uh, ads run against him. And so, so as far as negative ads run against an individual candidate, he's number three in the nation. And in case you didn't guess, one and two did not win. <laughs> okay, we have we did one. We spend a lot of money against you guys. You're right. <laughs> we have one last question. You guys question. really get a raise in money. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, we had a quick mention of suburban moms and a couple comments about underestimating some of the female candidates in this race. But a huge part of the national conversation this cycle has been the role of gender and you know the move um, 
of women towards the Democratic Party, the increasing move, and also uh, doing a lot of the groundwork on campaigns. So I was just curious if you guys had any thoughts on the impact of this cycle and what that mean might mean moving forward. Yeah, um, you know, the gender gap is growing and getting bigger um, in every cycle that predates Hillary Clinton, goes back to the 80s, it keeps getting more and more stark. Um, the way that maps into party primaries is a big part of the reason why so many Democratic women got elected, but not many Republican women got nominated. Um, so I think there's, there are a lot of implications there to think about, about what the future of representation clearly is of women, if you think about how partisan that gets. Um, I think suburban moms got a lot of attention because the fastest growing divide between the parties is education. If I take you back to the late 90s, there was practically no difference between how college educated whites and non-college educated whites voted. And this is only really a divide we see with white voters. After 2000, but blowing up in 2016, that gap just got bigger and bigger with non-college whites who cluster in rural areas getting more Republican, college educated whites who cluster in suburban areas getting more Democratic. And that gap is actually so big now, it's bigger than the gender gap. Uh, Hillary Clinton and Democrats running nationally this year did better among men with college degrees than they did with white men with college degrees than they did among white women without a college degree. So, you know, that intersects absolutely with, you know, education and, and gender, and it really created this environment where suburban women, many of whom have traditionally been Republican, but they're drifting away from that, were really, really pissed off. And they, they turned out in large numbers and a huge slew of Democratic women got elected. Um, up and down the ballot, I mean, state legislatures up to Congress. So it is, I think, appreciating how those two trends go together. Uh, you know, that education trend really, it really accounts for most of why suburbia and rural America are pulling apart politically. I think if you can understand that divide, the intersection of that with gender, you can understand where the parties are going right now. I would also say that, I mean, this isn't exactly an answer to your question, but I do think in Kansas, at least moving forward, that uh, more women should run for office. I mean, that if you look at the, some of the districts where we didn't have candidates this cycle, the Democrats at least, House districts specifically, not Senate districts, but some of the House districts, there wasn't like this groundswell of women candidates running in Kansas, aside from, quite frankly, uh, you know, Sharice and Laura. Uh, there were some, that's not to say there weren't any, but I do think that taking a look at 2020, some of these seats that are winnable for Democrats, certainly women should be stepping up to run for them, because I mean, there were, you know, just from the former organization that I worked with, Emily's List, I don't believe that Emily's List endorsed any women in the down ballot space here in Kansas, aside from mm -hmm. Laura and Therese. Uh, and there are places, you know, New, there are several other states, states around here, Missouri, for example, where Nicole Galloway was running in the down ballot space, and there was probably, I don't know Missouri politics well enough to say. But I do think that, the, I think, in the next two years, as people look towards who's running in 2020 and what recruitment like, looks like more women should be running these seats. Absolutely. The, num the number of women in the Kansas legislature actually shrunk in this election and it's been declining long term. We're one of the few states where it's actually been declining. And I think a lot of that is because it's getting increasingly hard for Republican women to win the primaries. Uh, and we, we are a more Republican state. But that, that goes beyond just the legislature. Like you look at county commissioners in Kansas, heading into this election, 89% of Kansas county commissioners were white men. And yeah, two women got elected to the Johnson County board, one woman in Sedgwick, but that number barely moved on election day. It's still over 85%. So yeah, women made a step towards more equal. They're not equal yet. They have a long way to go, but they made a step towards that in the election, but they're nowhere near parity, especially when you get down the ballot. And that's how you build a bench for the rest of the, the offices, honestly. So it is an important thing. Uh, I, I will say as a um, former, well, sort of also a current staffer of Lynn Jenkins, um, that uh, th that is, yeah, that, that's a concern for re Republicans. And I always found it odd that during in Republican primaries, she always did better with men than women. And I was told that that's pretty consistent amongst Republican primaries. Republican women don't support them at, at the same rates that Democrat women support women. Interesting. Oh. Okay. Do we have any other final comments? Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming out today, but I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion.
Thank you very much. Hope to see you here next week for our National Post-Election Conference. <laughs>